Hello, hello, my friends. Welcome to The Habitus. Uh, follow us on Twitter at Habitus Pod and on Stitcher and iTunes and TuneIn and SoundCloud and YouTube. My name's Michael Patterson. I'm here with my co-host. Bobby Lowe. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the third entry of The Journeyman, our ongoing series of episodes dedicated to filmmakers um, who might not ordinarily be thought of, uh, in traditional terms at least, as auteurs and or who might not be honoured with retrospectives or discussions around their filmographies as a single um, body of work. Uh, now, of course, the habitus being the habitus, um, of course, we went off off brand immediately with our first entry in this series on uh, Darren Aronofsky, who very much didn't fit the criteria uh, we'd set ourselves. Bobby, I'm blaming you for that. I believe that was your idea to cover Aron- Aronofsky as the as the first journeyman. I believe it was your idea to start a film podcast with a discussion of a TV show. Though. <laughs> It was indeed our very, very first episode dedicated to Twin Peaks. Listen to that if you already Although haven't. that's a contentious definition. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, and then we followed uh, it up with a second entry in the Journeyman series uh, with John Singleton, who arguably satisfied our entry requirements a little more than Aronofsky had. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that our focus for this one, the third Journeyman episode, George P. Kuzmatos uh, is the first filmmaker we're covering who fits the bill quite comfortably. Um, yeah, he's the first legit journeyman. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we have others in the works who return us to contentious territory with regard to the definition of journeyman. <laughs> but anyway, more on that later. Um, Kuzmatos was born to a Greek family in Florence in Italy uh, in January 1941 spent his childhood in Egypt as well as in Cyprus, uh, the country which features in his first feature we'll get to in due course. Um, And he died in April 2005, aged 64, having directed a relatively small number of feature films, 10 in total. Uh, They are, and I'm going to list them in in the chronological order by which we're going to proceed through them, and I'll list them by year as well. 1971, Sin. 1973, Massacre in Rome, 1976, The Cassandra Crossing, 1979, Escape to Athena, 1983, Of Unknown Origin, 1985, Rambo, First Blood Part Two, 1986, God, he's on a hot run here, 1986, Cobra, 1989, Leviathan, 1993, Tombstone, and then in 1997, Shadow Conspiracy. Um, Conspiracy thrillers, westerns, Underwater creature features, rat race, horror allegories, war adventures, historical dramas, disaster movies, action thrillers, and so on and so forth. Uh, quite a diverse body of work. Um, I'm sure you'll agree, Bobby. Yeah, absolutely. And that was part of the appeal of doing this series, because in any given journeyman episode, you get the opportunity to talk about a lot of different genres, a lot of different uh, subject matters, and a lot of different kind of uh, f- film periods, film movements, and so on. Yeah. Without, uh, whereas, without... whereas we, I, for, I found, for example, with the Singleton episode, even though you said that he satisfied our uh, eligibility criteria better than Aronofsky, which I agree with, that the first kind of 10 or 11 years of his career from Boys in the Hood to Baby Boy, it is very much the work of an auteur working yeah. with recurring themes. And, and, you know, we found ourselves talking about a lot of the same topics about films in yeah. a lot of the same genres, whereas that's not going to yeah, be the case here at all. Yeah, I was going to say the idea of the journeyman appealed to me as well when you proposed it because it kind of unburdens you away from the responsibility to be a specialist or an expert in a particular genre um, or particular yeah. movement. Um, the unfortunate thing with Singleton um, is that we inevitably ended that episode with abduction. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, well, I don't know, we'll, we'll discover this as we go, I, I suppose, but I, I suspect that because Matt Oss's arc is more of an upward one in terms of a trajectory and, and quality and okay. other things. All right, let's go to it. Should we start with uh, Sin, otherwise known as The Beloved? Look at that cat. He understands everything. If he could talk, what stories he could tell? Hmm? <sighs> Meow. 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 
Arrest is kisses Elena too much. You're upsetting my sleep. Now you don't care about me anymore. I'm going to scratch these eyes out. <laughs> You bring the old woman. Let her hear. I don't care about her. Let her hear. To hell with her. To hell with them. To hell with everybody. Let the whole world hear. I didn't choose him for my husband. I was given to him. Okay, so first up we have uh, Sin. Um, this one has a couple of different titles, and I wasn't able to determine definitively what the original title is it, it's entered in a lot of places as the beloved uh but i can't find any uh like record of it being released under that title i can't find any posters with that name on it and it's a pretty obscure film it's not like it was released loads of times it was re- mm. it was definitely released in the uk as sin and it was definitely released in the us later as restless uh and the beloved was definitely the working title i don't know if it was ever actually released as the beloved but anyway generally known as Sin or The Beloved or Restless, 1971, uh, kind of, um, uh, it's almost like a modern Greek tragedy kind of story, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the plot, uh, when Orestes, played by uh, Richard Johnson, returns to his Greek island homeland after several years in London to settle his late father's estate, he begins an affair with his childhood friend Elena, played by Raquel Welsh, uh, who is now and has been for several years married to his other childhood friend, Yanni. Uh, their um, affair ultimately leads to the partially accidental, partially purposeful killing of Yanni and le- leads the village and the island community to turn against them. And... Uh, ultimately leads to to further violence and escalations um so you and i are the respectively seventh and eighth people to log this film as <laughs> as viewed on on letterboxd uh which makes it without question the most obscure film we've covered on the show so far um, but that's unbelievable though i mean like i can't believe that before us there were only six people who'd logged it um yeah. on letterboxd i mean like okay so we've established it's credentials in terms of its obscurity but like surely more people have you know in the world have sought this out i mean in the world meaning like letterboxd users uh mm. who you know by and large tends to be frequented by completists and the kind of people who would want to watch because george p because matters debut feature presumably i don't know it's just really yeah well weird. i mean and it's not it's and not Raquel like really... as well <laughs> it's not really difficult to find either. Like I got it on Amazon and I, I only paid like eight or nine euro for it. You know, it's not like mm. one of those DVDs that they're, they're selling for 150 euro. Um, well, I, I but... bought it for one pound 50 um, from the <laughs> UK secondhand DVD chain CX and uh, was appalled. Actually, it's a, it must be the journeyman curse because when I ordered Shaft uh, with Samuel Jackson for our um, Singleton episode, they sent me the Richard Roundtree uh, shaft instead, which, you know, I, I ended up watching. Instead of sending me the George P. Matter Sin, they sent me the uh, Ving Rames and Gary Oldman version. And so when I went back online to see, like, you know, if they had the Kismatos, they, they were out of stock. So I can't even send it back now to to get it changed. Anyway, I saw Sin by other means. But, but yeah, you're right. The... That 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 um, Gary Oldman one. It's not it's not a version of this one though. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's, it's just it's a complete. Yeah, completely different. <laughs> it's yeah, not yeah. a remake or anything. <laughs> <laughs> Gary Oldman in the Raquel Welch role. Um, Gary Oldman has an affair with his childhood friend Ving Rhames. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> so this is a weird. This is this was produced as it's one of two films that was produced. Uh, this is a British production, right? This is like the, yeah. the the country of origin is the UK. It was shot on location in Cyprus, um, but it, it was it's effectively a Raquel Welch vehicle uh, yeah. produced by her uh, her agent, right? Um, her husband pa- and manager, Patrick Curtis. Yeah, right. Husband. Yeah, is that right? Okay, uh, okay. Uh, Patrick Curtis, 
um, based on a play written by Cosmatos called The Day of the Midwife. Mm. And uh, But isn't it what struck me first about the movie going in knowing that knowing that it was it's effectively like a, you know a v, like because obviously Rocco Welch became famous for uh, Fantastic Voyage and yeah uh, one million years BC in the mid sixties so this was like this began production in nineteen seventy was this this supposed to be like a star making uh, film for her yeah what what ma- but like this is so culturally specific and so like it's it's this very specific depiction of this parochial Greek island community. Why, yeah. <laughs> like, why this? Why this story? Uh, I thought that was very it's a strange. Strange one, yeah. It's a strange one, as you mentioned, uh, based on Cosmatos's play, The Day of the Midwife. Um, he shoots the whole thing with like a documentarian, observational uh, edge, uh, which I think lends some of the sequences an amazing like vitality. Like, you know, if 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 we're in the if we're in the game of perpetuating cultural stereotypes, if I was to think of a Fulham in reference to the sort of Mediterranean, like heart on emotion, uh, high passion uh, mode, this would very much be up there for me. Um, there are some tremendous sequences, like that one in which uh, Elena, is it, Raquel Welch's character, mm-hmm. um, gets drunk and dances. Uh, with like all the women on the island in this like really weird uh, dance ritual. Well, not it's not weird. It's just it's a it's a it's a local custom um, re- regarding like phallic baguettes of bread, etc., yeah. etc. Um, <laughs> like I was like, wow, this is like really entrancing. And a large part of that is, I suppose, Welsh's star persona that's been plonked into the middle of this, like incongruently uh local uh yeah like documentarian it's it's so weird like it it feels it feels like um this should be like her first film or something before she was a star and it it feels like this is this is like you know george p cosmatos's film he's actually credited on he's credited as yorgo pan cosmatos here yeah uh but because obviously based on his play and everything but the project originated from Raquel Welch's end, and it's just hard to understand what she saw this as being like a stepping stone to, you mm. know. Uh, not only because its commercial prospects seem inherently limited by how culturally specific it is, um, but also because she doesn't really have a lot to do in the film. She barely, correct me if I'm wrong if I missed it, but I think she speaks exclusively in monosyllables until 45 minutes into the film. <laughs> I think the first time she has a sentence is 45 minutes in. She doesn't say, she barely says a word. She says no and yes and things like that. Uh, and it's not part of the plot that she is that way. You know, mm. we don't, her character is not portrayed as being kind of, um, you know, timid or reserved or anything like that. Like the dance sequence that you mentioned is the exact opposite of that. Yeah, it's not uh, like Apollonia. So when she actually from, spoke uh, a Godfather, sentence, right? yeah. no, yeah, when she actually spoke a sentence 45 minutes into the film, I was like shocked. <laughs> You know, and that was only it was only then that I realized that she hadn't prior to that. Uh, and mm. she's top build, and it's supposed to be a vehicle for her. And yet, it's very much, uh, you know, Richard Johnson's film. Like it's his, he's the lead. Yeah, uh, it's all it all revolves around him. Um, so you, I noticed on Letterboxd, liked this film. Yeah, uh, I didn't. I didn't really like it. Uh, what yeah, what did you like I, about I, it? I ultimately liked it. Um... Uh, it's you know thin plot executed extremely well i felt um there's that christian uh, you know i keep mentioning christian petzel i'll make a fan of you of him i'll make a fan of you of him <laughs> uh one of these days you make him a fan of me <laughs> um because it reminded me of a moment in jericho uh petzel's film and it's a pivotal moment in this film when they're at sea and yanni it goes into the water uh, falls into the water from the boat and he says, you know, I can't swim. How his wife, Elena, didn't already know that, I don't know. But having, you know, mid-affair, uh, Elena and Orestes realise that, you know, as you mentioned, he falls in by accident, but it's like, oh, uh, do we save him? Do we not? Is this like an opportunity to sort of, you know, uh, live happily yeah. ever after? Um, so like murder, murder him by inaction. 
Yeah, sure. Um, and it's preceded by like a, a scene of drunken frivolity at the beach, uh, which I, you know, I, I felt like it was, it was compelling enough in a very sort of um, lo-fi way, like this lo-fi atmosphere given by the, you know, the sweaty location shoot um, and the voice dubbing as well, which gives like a kind of like an obsolete charm to this production. Um, you know, like the voice dubbing and the panting of scenes, which gives like the texture of, you know, passionate love scenes, a kind of like a crudeness and a, like a raspy uh, texture and edge uh, that kind of makes me aware at every turn that I'm watching like a debut feature or watching a film that was made in a very, very particular um, mode of production. Um, and then after the affair, I like the portrayal of the way in which the community just closes its ranks around the couple in this very sort of hysterical um, fashion. Um, you know, you've got you've got a sequence late on of a sacrificial cow being cross-cut against, uh, like, everything happening in the village. And it's like a really sort of intensified sequence of montage that um, I presume must have been some kind of influence on Coppola's Apocalypse Now. Um, just to put that, a, a, pos uh, a possible influence out there that this film has. You think Coppola is one of the other six people who's seen this film? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, out, of, out of curiosity, like, has any of those six people rated it? Uh, let me just check. Um, yes. So it has. Uh, you you gave it a six out of ten, right? Yeah, yeah. I downgraded okay. it after completing the entire filmography of um, Cosmatos, but originally right. it was kind of like a seven. Okay, I gave it a five. Uh, General Ursus gave it a four. Uh, Dedu Dada gave it a four, and Richard T gave it a seven. Oh, Dedu uh, Dada is uh, Coppola. That's that's Coppola's online. Ah, yeah, name. Okay. it's well known. Yeah, he's well known for using that <laughs> online uh, name. Obviously, like, you know, to be asked, what did you like about it? Um, and then subsequently merely describe the film rather than actually mm -hmm. say what I liked about it. Um, I don't know. It has a, it has this kind of like a, I don't, I don't. It has, it has its moments and it has little touches that I enjoyed. Uh, I, I thought that I was going to really like it early on when uh, Orestes <laughs> starts talking to the priest about wanting to sell his father's land to his his extremely religious neighbor, who's an onion farmer. Yeah. And the priest tells him that there's no way that he'll ever buy that land unless he thinks that the land has some sort of religious significance. Mm -hmm. And the priest basically just suggests to Orestes that he and Orestes go and rob a grave and plant, <laughs> plant <laughs> bones and like a skull in yeah. his land and then get a, get his onion farmer neighbor to help with the... Uh, excavation of the land and mm. then claim that the bones are the bones of a saint uh, which they do and it's this weird little subplot that doesn't really go anywhere but it's definitely uh, I definitely thought that that was hilarious the, <laughs> the I like priest the, uh, yeah. Yeah. I like the um, very very short scene in which uh, Orestes and his neighbour start to eat uh, raw onions as if yeah. just, like apples <laughs> freshly fallen from the tree um, just little moments like that that I felt uh, accumulated yeah. to something resembling like a communal portrait alongside this sure. like, star vehicle. Um, and I think, well, I mean, I, I'm i surprised you didn't like it a little more than you did because, um, you know, what did you make of like, so when, when, you know, they've been found out, the couple and the community, as I say, closes ranks around them and you've got that whole like horror sequence or sequence bordering on horror late on, like, you know, with like all the false blood everywhere and like the wide angle lenses being used and like there's knives, you know, knives out for one another and it all gets a little bit dramatic, let's say. It's okay. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's all right. I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. The, the scene, uh, the, the, the stronger aspects of the film, with the exception of those couple of funny moments near the beginning, I think come near, do come near the end uh, when Elena starts having... Uh, starts, you know, uh, her her guilt becomes kind of overwhelming over what they've done to Yami, mm. and her dissatisfaction with how the community is now treating them. 
uh, like the priest won't give her communion and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Um, there's a cat on the windowsill and she becomes convinced that the cat is somehow Yanni. Mm. And I thought, okay, this is, this is an interesting turn. And then there's another very weird. And I think the best scene in the film when, uh, she, it's actually right after the priest refuses her communion. Uh, she's chased by this, uh, gang of kids who, uh, she, she hides inside a building and then she comes out and the kids all, uh, advance on her. Yeah, uh, in a very very sinister fashion, and then like rip her clothes. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, it reminded me a little bit of uh, Have you seen Ryan's Daughter? No, I haven't. It's a similar kind of uh, uh, community judging and punishing a sort of fallen woman mm-hmm. in that kind of way. In that, mm-hmm. that reminded me of that scene. Um, also, the best scene in that film. Uh, and I, I liked when Orestes tries to leave and the villagers all try to stop him and like one guy stands in front of him and sort of presents him with this big fish. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's pretty funny. And the, the like I said, it's kind of like a modern uh, Greek myth. It has that kind of, you know, uh, Greek tragedy sort of uh, yeah. feeling to it. Yeah. Uh, and it literally being, you know, set in Greece. It, was shot in, it is set in Greece, isn't it? It's, it was shot in Cyprus, but it's set in one, one of the Greek islands. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, but it does, it, it has, it has this kind of, particularly, as I said, in the latter half, um, it has this, not entirely successful, but at least demonstrates aspirations toward working in a kind of mythic register mm. that I responded to. But for me, the, the film is fatally flawed, uh, to the extent that I can't really say that I liked it. And the problem is the film opens with, uh, shots of three kids like running and frolicking on the beach. Mm. And those kids are, we are, we take them to be Elena, uh, Orestes and Yanni as mm. kids. Okay. And the film ends with the same images. Um, but that's all the insight that we get into the relationship between those three characters prior to Orestes return to the Island. Uh, and when Orestes returns to the Island, he is just like an asshole. You know, he, he, he walks into Yanni's home, like his, supposedly his best friend who he hasn't seen him in years, and he just insults him. He talks about like, what else was I going to do? Of course I stayed in London. I'm going to come back here and be a peasant farmer. Uh, he starts eyeing up Yanni's wife immediately. Yeah. You know, yeah, starts an affair with her. Still. You know, yeah, it's Wells. yeah but I, like, and and also then Elena, um, is supposed to be uh, Arresti's childhood friend as well, mm. but for all the film presents us with with them as adults they may as well have never met before he may, she may as well just be Yanni's wife no that's like true only, it, yeah that's true it is underwritten uh, and under dramatized it's, in, it's it's enormously underwritten to the point that like uh like i said Raquel Welsh barely speaks a word until 45 minutes into this 83 minute film yeah um and you know like we get the beach shot but we never get a sense of Elena Orestes and Yanni's friendship or whatever the triangle dynamic there was between mm-hmm. them. And I, that is crucial to what happens, and it's just omitted. Um, you know, and like, I I actually went and corrected the the plot synopsis on Letterboxd, because it was actually incorrect. It said that Yanni was the person who had returned to the Greek island, so I rewrote it. Right. Um, but it originally said that he started up, he, he found himself drawn back to his teenage passion, Elena. Now, the kids that we see at the beginning and end aren't teenagers, Mm. Um, and I don't see any, I don't know who wrote that synopsis, but you know, like to, to take it as, as Coppola. suggested that he, he <laughs> <laughs> Coppola said, it. so like we, as like, we only see them as kids. Like, are we to take it that they had some sort of teenage relationship? Are they former lovers? All we get from Elena is that she says that she never loved Yanni, but that she was in love with some guy named Yorgos. Yeah. Uh, who we never meet, and it just like there's just this void at the center of it. Like you, you have to have that. It's crucial, um, and it's just not there. And you know, on top of that, you have the fact that Raquel Welsh is famously not a very good actor, um, and you know, the whole like emotional weight of the film ostensibly sits on her shoulders, and it's just again, it's just not there. Yeah. So I was kind of, I was kind of picking little. Little bits of, like I mentioned, the, the cat scene, the scene with the kids, the scene with the grave robbing, the scene with Orestes trying to leave the, the village and yeah. things like that. Um, but like the, the, the three central relationships, like Orestes, Elena, 
Yanni, Elena, and Orestes Yanni, they're all just not there. Mm. Um, for me, at least. Well, there you go again, ruining my appreciation of a film. <laughs> well uh, let's talk about the mother character, actually, because we didn't mention her. Uh, so uh, I, Yanni's I, I mother. I must confess, I thought she died, and then she's all of a sudden um, alive again. No, she had a stroke. Ah, okay. Because, outside the door, right, she right. she she has a she has a stroke from the shock of of realizing that her son has actually been murdered by yeah. Elena, who I think were to take it that she has never really been all that fond of Elena. Yeah, see, anyway, I misinterpreted and, uh, the subsequent scene after that stroke, or the scene in which she collapses, what I took to be mm-hmm. her death, because the subsequent yeah. scene suggests that like there's been some sort of like ceremony, like mourning her death. Right. Um. And then, uh, no, that's yeah. that's that's Yanni's funeral. Yeah, yeah, but I know there's there's yeah. two scenes very similar. Right, right. There's the mother's funeral, and then there's Yanni's. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, yeah, the mother character who is a kind of a vegetative witness to all of the violence happening in the final scene. Yeah, so the the they end up having to care for uh, Yanni's mother in a kind of a scenario that reminded me of. Uh, Bobby and Shelley in Twin Peaks having to care for Leo <laughs> after they've started started their affair. Um, yeah. Uh, one, one, one last thing that I want to say about it is uh, I found the, the portrayal of the community and the, the community's like religiosity kind of confusing uh, because it seems like given the whole thing with the priest and the centrality of the church and also the way in which the community judges uh, Orestes and Elena – that it's a pretty religious community, right? And you would expect it to be. Yes. Uh, given the time and place. But you also have the dancing sequence that you you described where, like, Elena's, like, flashing her underwear and it's this. it feels very liberal, you know? Yeah. It feels very permissive. And you also have the scenes where uh, Yanni and his, his co-workers on the, in the fields are eating lunch and there's a whole, like, uh, like very kind of open flirtation going on between... Uh, that leads ultimately leads to a fight between uh, two of the men over one of them kind of uh, flirting with with the guy's wife. Yeah, which is where she's like sh- sh- she is sitting with her legs open and stuff. Yeah. So I don't know what we're to take from that exactly because it doesn't feel like it doesn't feel like uh, repressed sexuality in the community. It feels like <laughs> a community kind of at odds with itself, where mm. it's like, well, we're very religious and conservative, but we also have these very liberal, provocative dances and. Uh, I mean, the provocative dance I don't know, I find that takes confusing. place when the genders are separated, um, which may or may not be of interest. I suppose, yeah. that's true. Um, the, the fight scene that you've just mentioned is also cross-cut, with, which I liked. Um, it's a parallel montage with the sex scene between Elena and Aristides, and there's this idea of um, like the whole island's uh, impulsive persona kind of uh, operating in sync almost so you've got like you know the blood running through the veins that leads to violence as well as like an affair that shouldn't be happening at the same time um reminded me um of the best edited sequence in the wire the tv series of daniels and perlman having sex while cutty hits the bag remember that yeah that was i found that pretty confusing as well (laughs) (laughs) what was being suggested in that scene (laughs) Um, so what would you give this out of 10? Uh, I give it a 5. Okay. It, ha- it has elements that I like, but overall I have to pass on it. Okay, 6. So s- since, um, yeah, 6 for me. Yeah. Okay, so uh, at this point in previous Journeyman episodes, I've uh, run through a, in, in the case of Aronofsky, usually a pretty long list of uh, projects that the director was attached to in between this film and that film. Uh, but because a George Cosmatis is like actually a journeyman director who doesn't inspire the same sort of uh, media attention um, and investment in in uh, their uh, their work as an investment in their in their career as a kind of uh, a body of work, um, and also secondly that we're going back twenty years further even than John Singleton, like we're talking about a nineteen seventy one film. Whereas with Singleton, we started in 91, and with Aronofsky, we started in 98, accepting his... Actually, we started in 91 with him as well, with uh, with uh, his, his short. But I haven't been able to find anything that Cosmatis was attached to between Sin and his second film, 1973's Massacre in Rome. Colonel, I came here because you have been kind to me. 
And I would like to know what will happen now. Innocent. It will people. be a fair reprisal, Father, carried out according to the laws of the Hague Convention. So war is lost too. Yes, and we will respect them. The law provides for retaliation against illegal attacks on our armed forces. They said it was an act of open warfare. They? Do you know them? How many are there? Two, three, five? Who are they, Father? Everybody. It's the only thing people are talking about all over Rome. But you haven't said anything. You've given a warning. If the persons responsible do not come forward, we shall shoot. They are still waiting to hear. They might give themselves up. And what would we do with a handful of assassins? That's not enough, Father. And you call this a reprisal? Did you make any effort to find the attackers? Did you make a public announcement warning the people of Rome what measures would be taken against them? You did not. Italy is our ally. Italy? But what Italy? There are two sides now. And you are on the wrong side. Now, Colonel, this is not a reprisal. Do not pretend to yourself. You are not big enough to cover crime with fancy words. This is human slaughter by any name. But you haven't even followed the most elementary rule of war. It's too late, Father. The machinery is running by itself. Then stop the machinery. The machinery is what you call God. I cannot stop it any more than I can, than a bullet can stop being fired by a gun. I'm a man, alone, weighing nothing in the scale of things. And you cannot stop it, Father. That is all. Now let the spin of the wheel decide. God doesn't spin wheels to decide the fate of man. Your God died 2,000 years ago. So Massacre in Rome, released in 1973, produced by Carlo Ponti, written by Kuzmatos uh, with the novelist Robert Katz, uh, who had also authored the non-fiction book Death in Rome, upon which the film is based. Um, it takes place in the German-occupied Italian uh, capital, Rome, in 1944, um, and it dramatises a real-life uh, incident. Firstly, an attack by a group of anti-fascist partisans on an SS police regiment in the city. And then secondly, uh, the process by which the Germans decided upon and then carried through uh, their brutal reprisal, um, i.e. the rounding up and execution of 335 people, known as the uh, Ardiatina Massacre. Principal agents in the film are Herbert Kaplan, Rome's real-life Gestapo chief, played here by Richard Burton, and local priest father Pietro Antonelli, played by Marcello Mastroianni. Um, and, you know, several other faces in and amongst the crowd. Um, I was going to ask, I know we've, we're, you know, I'm not going to dig dig up the corpse again, but uh, with Sin, um, I wonder if it had been more of a commercial success, if it would have accommodated a more auteuristic career on Cosmatos's part. Because, you know, it was based on his play, um, it, it set in on a Greek island, um, et cetera, et cetera. I, you know, I don't, I don't know if it had been big, a bigger hit if it would have launched something that was less sort of journeyman-like, because this is a very, very different film, I think you'll agree. Sure. Uh, although I, I don't think it's, it doesn't seem to be any less personal to him. Yeah. Uh, mm. You know, but yeah, I mean, his, his last writing credit is on uh, his fourth film, Escape to Athena. Mm-hmm. So he has a writing credit on his first four films mm-hmm. and then no further writing credits for the rest of his career. Uh, yeah, maybe. Who knows? Um, so I just uh, finished watching this film about five minutes before we started recording. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Um, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was it was really, really good. Um, really interesting. Um, reminded me a little bit of uh, Rome Open City. Yeah. Um, but I... I I thought I was surprised the way that it the way that it starts up. Uh, I was expecting a kind of a similar emphasis on the resistance that you get in in Rome Open City. Yeah, Rome Open City is kind of like probably more heavily weighted on that side, although you do get quite a bit with the the uh, the Nazi command as well. But they kind of recede into the background as the film goes on, and it becomes more about the the, the really like brutally rational logistics of carrying out a massacre yeah overwhelmingly uh, so, yeah. you just spend yeah. a, you just spend a lot of time with uh richard burton's character and and his various other like lieutenants and generals uh just trying to figure out 
like the, the, this has come down from Hitler himself that the the retribution needs to be uh, you know times ten. Yeah, sure. So 33, 33 uh, SS troops were killed. They need to kill three hundred and thirty Italians, and yeah. they're struggling to put them together. You know, he's making lists of it's almost like doing a budget for something. You know, it's like well, we can get this much money from here and this much money from here. It's like well, we can get seven people from this jail. We can get fifteen from here, yeah. and then we can get maybe fifty from here. We'll fill out we'll fill out the rest of that with Jews, uh, and it's just like incredibly um, cold and disturbing in its in its coldness and its its uh, banality and. Uh, the the theme that emerges throughout the movie that I responded to is uh, the system versus the individual and the idea of like being sort of a cog in a machine and that's like how Richard Burton's character uh, justifies his action not not justifies his actions but uh, you know sort of exonerates himself and absolves himself. Um, so let me ask you a question. Kapla um, in real life, um, by all accounts, was the diametric opposite of the way Burton plays him. Um, Burton plays him as this, and he's written as such. He's he's a weary, practical, um, pragmatic soldier who recognizes that you know the Reich's falling and the war days are coming to an end, um, and he he believes you know the fall of Germany is imminent. Um, mm-hmm. In real life, you know, he was, I think, a lot younger. He was zealous. He was um, very much the kind of figure that you would, that would be appointed as the Gestapo chief in Rome when Germany began mm-hmm. to occupy it. Um, now that script, that decision from the from a script point of view, I've I've seen criticisms of the Fuller made around that that his character should be more sort of um, less relatable more sort of um you know brutal and ruthless and more sort of in line with how the historical account of Kapler reads um i know what i feel about it i don't think i think it's to the film's advantage that he's made you know in in air quotes relatable yeah i was surprised actually how uh, borderline sympathetic the portrayal of the the nazi and the ss characters yeah was uh, yeah, but I, no, but I, I think it, it it definitely makes the film kind of feel uh, more um, unique. But it, it's I think that decision to write him like this and to play him like this underscores what you've just said, which is why I asked like the banality of the evil. Like, mm. it's not that these people you know need to be referred to or grappled with in terms of their uh, goodness or badness. Um, it's it's the systemic context yeah. in which individual deeds are committed um and it's and it's not to and it's not to excuse individual acts from in in terms of well you know they're just following orders or whatever it's not that's not it at all for me it it it, it underscores the the inherent tragedy of a piece like this you know like a an historic yeah. dramatization of something that actually happened something unfathomably horrible um and it attempts something quite ambitious for me uh in in following it from the perpetrator's sides um yeah yeah i agree with that and i mean but there, it's not it, burton's character uh kapler is not um he's not portrayed as blindly following orders no he like his his individual motivation throughout the whole movie is as you said, he, he he sees the war coming to an end. He sees the Allies winning, uh, and he knows that that's imminent. Um, and his primary uh, concern is f- to avoid repercussions for what for his actions, which will be classified as war crimes. Yeah. And he doesn't want to, at the very very tail end of the war, carry out some horrendous massacre that uh, you know. <laughs> causes him to be sentenced to death or well, whatever. Yeah, I mean, he's basically trying to save his own skin. Yeah, the early the early considerations as you said are like just the equivalent of like brand management. It's like how do we come out mm-hmm. of this um with the moral high ground intact? Um which I like which, when he's uh, when he's yeah. talking to uh to um Dolman, um played by John Steiner, uh they're having dinner together, they're both very aware that the war is coming to an end mm. and that the chances of uh, you know, Nazi victory are diminishing by the day uh 
yeah no i like i like that i like the idea of like these people trying to um like i said save their own skin but they are also aware that they can like like um kapler pushes back against uh the orders that he's getting which he sees as like initially the order given to him by his immediate superior is uh not 10 times retribution but 50 times Mm. and he's he's doing what he can within kind of the confines of his position and his power and his uh his uh, authority to push back against that and to sort of he's and i also liked uh the way everybody is asking for written uh orders yeah. so it's like once once this once the dust clears on this i want to be able to absolve i want, want to be able to absolve myself of any responsibility for this by pointing and saying look i was only following yeah, orders yeah. and not have not have not have my superior go i never gave that yeah. order uh you know i, I liked i like that the idea that this like the whole like house of cards is like falling down around them and they can see that although some of them can't is like his immediate superior still thinks that he still seems to think that uh they're gonna win the war or whatever um yeah no i i, I like and i also liked the the late revelation although it's kind of like suggested throughout with the the um the uh uh the bishops and so on in the, in the within the vatican uh the collaboration between the church and the nazis and the, the the fact that the church saw fascism as preferable to communism yeah yeah because communism is because communism is atheistic uh, yeah, the, the, what is it? What I thought that, it was, say that, that was the, very the, interesting. They say the Germans are the last bulwark against atheist communists or communism. Yeah, yeah. Um, which you know yeah. is 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 true. You know that's that's what the position was. Absolutely, but I thought that was quite an interesting. Uh, yeah, I think it's quite a kind of multifaceted film, but it's also quite tense and I like, like reminiscent of like army of shadows or something like that as well where yeah i love i love those um i love those suspense and this is like early on in the film when i thought that the film was going to focus more on the resistance but i love like suspense sequences that don't really consist of any action they just consist of like shots of people walking and, and looking and people looking at their and, watches and wait waiting yeah. looking at their watches looking up at windows you know yep. looking a little bit nervous and it's all just like acting with their eyes and it's all the montage the sound the music and these minimalist performances and uh, and yet, it's it's so like and Ennio Morricone's uh, score is it's like this great kind of thumping rhythmic score. Um, yeah, no, I thought this was really excellent. I really enjoyed. I think it. Um, you know, I think that sequence uh, where the resistance carries out its attack, which culminates in the thirty three deaths of the Germans, I think that's one of the best sequences because yeah. has ever done. It's a suspense sequence. Sure. You know, it, exactly what you've just said. You know, it's got. It, it creates a whole rhythm and synchronized plan of action without even ever like telling you what actually is going to go down. Um, and it's really, really yeah. great. And also, you know, like if, if we can indulge a little bit here in a very simple catharsis, because we know what's coming. If, if, if you do any sync, if you do any kind of research going into this film in terms of what it's about, what it's about, there's, a, there's that brief, ultimately heartbreaking catharsis of the simply very satisfying moment of just seeing these Germans getting blown to bits. Um, and, <laughs> these, you know, these Nazis. These Nazis, sorry, these Nazis. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry to all our German um, listeners. Yeah, it's weirdly uplifting. Um, yeah, and as I said, you know, again, just to reinforce the point, the decision to make Burton halfway sympathetic actually deepens the drama and it enriches the tragedy um, and then it's about, it's around the half, no, it's actually, it's just less than an hour when the logistics side starts to come into play. Um, and mm-hmm. if I may say so without sounding critical, it's kind of a plodding final 40 minutes, um, or, or like persistent rather than plodding maybe, because I, I definitely don't mean that to be a criticism. <laughs> um, like the last twenty, like the last twenty minutes is like this persistent, almost death march, um, like going through the operation site, like the map of it, almost as if they're going mm-hmm. into some sort of heist sequence. Like this is what's going to happen, this is, and you know, like yeah. the ordering of the alcohol because the, the 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 soldiers yeah. might need it. That's the 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 sequence that we heard in the clip. Yeah. Um. um yeah. No, I mean, I I actually really. That was kind of the point where I, 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 the, the actual attack on the SS uh, March, um, is an early highlight. But I, 
the, the point at which I started to think, wow, this is really unique and I haven't really seen a film like this before is, is that emphasis on, you know, just them trying to find people to execute. Mm. And it's just like numbers. So we just need people like, like yeah. just filling it out. Like we need, okay, we have 50 from here. We have 20 from here. Uh, and trying to get try, trying to get you know like ringing people in the middle of the night to get orders or to get to get orders confirmed or to get permission to do this and like people trying to pass the book like the the head of the Italian police trying to get orders and the other guy saying you know you yeah you have my permission and him saying well can I get it in writing he's like I'm not going to give it to you in writing yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. and everybody's like just trying to just trying to get uh keep their hands clean yeah. of what everybody knows is uh, a bad decision a bad call yeah. um for everyone involved obviously not least the the uh, people who are going to be executed um what did you make of uh mastriani's character the priest yeah um, uh, uh, i suppose the the virtuous figure in a film that uh, portrays his colleagues and up the upper echelons of his milieu um as a, in a kind of condemn condemnatory fashion right Sure. Yeah. No, I thought I thought his performance was good. Uh yeah, I mean you need you need somebody in the church to Absolutely, yeah, to highlight to give, the to give you that yeah. kind of side. And of I it. think his particularly later on, his uh exchanges with Burton like are really electric. Mm. And that's that's the point yeah. at which, you know, this the human scale here just disappears into the horrors. Mm. Um Yeah yeah exactly. like yeah. I was a little bit dis- little bit disappointed that they didn't that the whole thing at the beginning where he, they're they're kind of round in a roundabout way accusing him of potentially having forged a painting yeah uh, and like f- sending fake artworks to the Third Reich instead and trying to hold on to the the uh, originals in Italy and Rome uh, a little bit disappointed that that didn't play into it mm-hmm. again that was kind of just an introductory thing and it sets up the relationship between um, Mastriani and Burton. Mm-hmm. Um, and it sets up their kind of mutual interests and their kind of, I don't know how much like it would be fair to say that Mastriani respects Burton, but there's a certain kind of like, um, certain kind of, you know, if they, if, if their life paths had been very, very different that maybe they, you know. Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's that moment, right. Where like Burton entertains something resembling that. And then like, um, when he is pushed, he's just like, yeah, this isn't happening. I am yeah, going yeah, to, yeah. you know, yeah. Um, yeah, don't, exercise don't my power. This, don't push yeah. your luck. Yeah. Um, which is a really, yeah. really great delivery as well. Um, great perform- Two great performances, actually. Um, so I'm guessing this is like an eight for you? This is, a, this is an eight for me. High seven for me. Uh, I'd love to see it on the big screen. I'd love to see it with an audience at a film festival or some sort of retrospective screening. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's impressive in ways I wasn't expecting, to be honest. Mm, yeah uh okay all right so uh once again i wasn't able to find any information about any thing that he was working on in the interim between massacre in rome and his third film 1976's the cassandra crossing i can't believe that a thousand people will be intentionally sent to their death by the international health organization it sort of defeats the purpose of the group doesn't it ask him on a hunch well, my last one didn't turn out too badly Dr. Chamberlain. Yes. Sorry we got cut off. You'll be arriving in Yanov in a little over four hours. Everything's been arranged. Can you think of anything else that you might need? Yes. There's one thing. Yes? The Cassandra Crossing. It's unsafe. What do you mean by that? I mean it's unsafe. It's a disused line that was closed down in 1948. Now, Doctor, the railroad authorities assure us that... And the people around there won't even live under it anymore. Oh, you've been there, have you? No, but the conductor has, and one of my passengers. They're standing right here beside me. Would you care to talk to them? Now, Dr. Chamberlain, you listen to me. We've had that bridge tested for stress tolerance by computer and personal inspection. I've got the figures right here in front of me. The Polish government has spent more money in the last two years rebuilding that bridge than it cost to build a goddamn thing in the first place. Why, there's no more risk to you than, than, than flying a scheduled airline. If that's the point, I don't fly. Colonel McKenzie is a liar. 
Okay, so film number three, 1976, is The Cassandra Crossing, uh, produced by Carlo Ponti and uh, screenplay by Tom Mankiewicz, Robert Katz, who had also written uh, Massacre in Rome, and George P. Cosmatis, uh, from a story by Katz and Cosmatis. Um, the plot of this one, okay. Uh, a terrorist infected with a deadly virus boards the Stockholm to Geneva Express and exposes all aboard to the disease. Uh, Colonel Mackenzie, played by Burt Lancaster, is called in to handle the situation and finds Dr. Chamberlain, played by Richard Harris, uh, to be on board the train. Mackenzie decides to reroute the train to the Cassandra Crossing, where it will plunge into oblivion. But passengers miraculously begin to recover, and Chamberlain must race against time to disconnect the cars. Um, what? What is the Cassandra Crossing, though? The Cassandra Crossing is a an old rickety bridge over a ravine. Um, oh, right. okay. That hasn't I haven't, been. I haven't seen it. It's, a, so... it's disused. Yeah, it's a disused bridge. <laughs> um, so, this is a really weird film. Okay. We covered we could we covered the towering inferno a few episodes back. Uh, please again, you know, listen to that if you if you need any preparation or you need any proof of our credentials in terms of disaster movies. Um, this is like a disaster movie that can't really decide what's the, what the disaster is meant to be. It, yeah. it begins as it's two completely different yeah. stories happening here. <laughs> it begins as like something like a prototype for Steven Soderbergh's Contagion, and then like the you know the 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 infection that like is unleashed on this like enclosed space hurtling th- across Europe. Yeah. Um, all of a sudden, just suddenly, like you know, doesn't turn out to be deadly at all. Yeah, it's 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 an okay. So the <laughs> the the set the setup is that um, these terrorists, I believe, they're breaking into the U.S. embassy uh, in is it in Brussels, um, wherever it is. Uh, they're breaking in because they've heard that the there's a some sort of like uh, biological weapon being developed yeah. in there, and that's our, well, we don't really ever find out if that's necessarily true. There is certainly uh, what is only referred to as a is it a mnemonic plague yeah, or something yeah, like mnemonic, that? Yeah, um, And the idea is that um, Burt Lancaster's character claims that it wasn't being developed. It was being, they were trying to destroy it. They were trying to figure out a way to destroy it. Uh, after he's informed that, you know, it's like a breach of international law to be developing a deadly pathogen in a, in a, you know, in another country, you're doing it here because you don't want to do it in the U S uh, but everything goes wrong anyway, and and one of the terrorists is shot and killed, and one of them is shot and incapacitated, and uh, one of them escapes and gets on the train, and then we we follow. Um, we're, that's when we're introduced to all of our characters in in traditional sort of disaster movie mm. fashion. All of the different relationships. So we have like uh, Richard Harris and his ex wife, played by Sophia yeah. Loren, uh, married to the producer have, by the way, so, Ricardo uh, Ponchi. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, we have Martin Sheen and his uh, his wife or girlfriend. Yeah, girlfriend. girlfriend. Yeah, because yeah. he's he's she's she's played yeah. by Ava Gardner and she's married. Yeah, and he's he's like her kind of boy toy. Yeah. Uh, and and we have O.J. Simpson returning from the Tower oh, yeah. Inferno here, uh, and he has this kind of relationship, not a relationship, but like you know he he for the purposes of the story he's paired up with. Uh, is it a nanny <laughs> with two kids on the yeah. train, something like that? Whatever it is, okay. And then we've got we've got a guy who is uh, very upset about the prospect of going across the Cassandra crossing into Poland because uh, he was previously in a concentration camp in Poland mm-hmm. and he doesn't want to go there. And we have various other, you know, like people on the train. We've we've young like uh, musicians yeah, as yeah. well, some hippies, um, some hippies who treat us to a song. Hippie, hippie, hippie musicians. Um, we do get a song, yeah. It's just an odd film from start to finish, but the so we get we get those we spend a lot of time as in typical disaster movie fashion, a lot of time setting up these characters, and then gradually they get sick and some of them die, and then eventually, like you said, it does it turns out to be nothing. They, it's like they decided two thirds of the way through the film that's the end of that story. Like the the plague, just this this deadly plague. Uh, what do they say about it? It's something like there's there's a it's something to do it's with oxygen. oxygen in the tree. There's a lot of yeah, oxygen. It's it's neutralizing the infection or whatever. And but why is there uh, why is there oxygen in the train? Is it to do with the, the guys from... in the white suits sealing the train up with with like neutral 
you're is like that it? like frozen o- oxygen. It's like it's right, liquid. yeah, because the train the train oxygen, is the train is quarantined. Yeah. yeah, but so the so the idea is that 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 uh, uh, Lancaster's character is sending the train to the Cassandra crossing. Um, they basically just want to bury the whole thing. Yeah, they don't want this getting out. That there's this this yeah. you know that they were developing or whatever storing or researching this uh, deadly pathogen in uh, in Brussels. Um, but people just spontaneously start recovering. Yeah. Okay, but before we even get to that, uh, <laughs> the, okay. So when we talked when we talked about um, the towering inferno, and like we talked about you know uh, other disaster movies from the period and later, like things like the Poseidon Adventure and stuff like that. Um, when you like, see, when you're talking about like the forces of nature, like fire and water and things sure. like that. Um, there's a sort of kinetic physical quality to watching people trying to survive something like an inferno or a flood or a sinking ship or whatever. When it comes to (laughs) a disease, what the characters are actually doing is just sitting around waiting to get sick or being sick and just sweating and sitting and lying down and it's it's there's there's no energy it's it's incredibly lethargic the entire thing you're just it's just a lot of like oh now 50 people are sick and like it does this what does he say a 60 percent infection mm. rate or something like that so you know it's like a six out of ten chance and like six out of ten people on the train are going to get sick and like you just kind of have to hope that you're not one of them you're naturally immune or whatever uh but it's it's just really not because like, like you mentioned soderbergh's contagion yeah which is a film that I really like, but Contagion is this panoramic, like, portrait of, of like, institutional responses to an yeah. outbreak. Uh, and it's really interesting in that respect. It's more, like, along the lines of... Its sensibility is more along the lines of something like The Wire, where it's like, well, how, this is if this event took place, this is how this institution would respond, and this is, like, and all that yeah. kind of stuff. Uh, this is not. This is, like, a contained, like, survival thriller on a train, but they're just sitting around. For most of the movie, um, how did you find the midsection of the film when everyone's just kind of sitting around yeah, sweating? Yeah, kind of like interminable. Um, <laughs> you've, you, did you mention is it the guy who's um, wanting doesn't want sorry to go back to Poland is Lee Strasberg, right? Hyman Roth from Godfather Part Two, the guy okay, with yeah, watches. Yeah, that's right. yeah, so every time we see him, he has a watch to waffle or steal, or he, he's a, and it's got these wonderful little comic touches, the kinds of you know corny little character details that, as you've mentioned you know, are there in the Towering Inferno. But then, yeah, I mean, it's almost as if they cottoned on to the fact halfway through production that this isn't quite cinematic enough. And therefore, we, we can't, mm. like, stop the film. We can't, like, start from scratch. So we then have to introduce something else that will ensure the extremely well done, I think, climax of, climax of the film. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And it becomes like this. I mean, I was reminded of the train level on Goldeneye for the Nintendo sixty four, like with all of these like yeah. guys in white suits, like um, well, they're in like uh, protection suits, aren't they? From the like, uh, yeah, they're infection. like haz- hazmat suits. Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, and with um, armed with machine guns, it turns out OJ Simpson's like a, a brilliant like because he plays like a priest, right? No, he's undercover um, as a priest. Ah, he's undercover, right? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Missed. He's that undercover as a priest. He's he's trying to he's trying to. So that's he's trying to. He isn't he under? He's investigating, uh, somebody on the train, and that somebody turns out to be Martin Sheen's character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who is uh, a drug smuggler? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like that. He's also a drug addict, because uh, he starts to get quote unquote sick at one point, and the doctor uh, Richard Chamberlain's character comes and examines right. him, and basically says. He doesn't. He's not yeah, infected. Yeah. He doesn't quite tell us what's going on. But later on, when we discover that he's uh, he's a heroin addict yeah. or whatever, and he's actually just undergoing uh, withdrawals. Um, yes, and it's really funny, like hilariously funny, that this surgeon played by Richard Chamberlain and this uh, guy who's Richard Harris, you know, just sorry, what Richard Harris plays Chamberlain. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Richard Chamberlain. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so Richard Richard Harris uh, is um, like at the, in the in the third act of the movie, they all just like take up arms. Yeah. They all just like pick That's up right. machine guns, like and, something like and, where uh, there or something um, with the train yeah, on the siege. Where it's like they're all these really talented, uh, you know, commandos, 
um, uh, which is something that we might come back to in the next film yeah, we yeah, talk indeed, about. Indeed, yeah. But uh, I just I love uh, the moment. It's, man. it's Honestly, funny. It's I um, stop laughing, like almost wetting myself with laughter when uh, Ingrid Doolin says to um, uh, Bert Lancaster, "Oh, wait, the dog's recovering," and we just cut to an image of the dog <laughs> with its tongue hanging out, just like almost yeah. smiling. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> unbelievably funny at some yeah. points, but uh, um, like even but, even like but yeah, the... once like w- once it gets really silly like that, I started to really like I had been a little bit disappointed in the midsection of the film where it's like okay, we're getting the combination of the typical disaster movie kind of soap yeah. opera stuff, and on top of that, they're they're not even fighting a fire or trying to survive a flood or an earthquake or something. They're just being sick they're just like running temperatures you know yeah. it's really not it's really not very energetic it's, it's like the, it's it's yeah. inherently lethargic because the yeah. people are just literally like losing their energy and like lying down um so when it does kind of just go for broke with the silliness and like has martin sheen like scaling the outside of the train because <laughs> <laughs> he's a ma- is, is he a mountain, a mountain climber or something yeah. like that there's yeah. something about that yeah uh <laughs> I just at that point at that point I started to really enjoy great, it. Um, great advertisement uh, as well for Adidas was... sneakers because uh, he wears a pair of white yeah. Adidas. And then his unfortunate. Can we can we kind of reveal what happens to Sheen? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, he's just blown away. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like as in he's shot. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't just blow off the side of the train. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing though, what an amazing <laughs> moment. Um <laughs> was just blown away by the wind. <laughs> amazing. Um, um Yeah. So I mean you have um Yeah, so the action, quote unquote. Yeah. Through the midsection of the film, it consists of because the because the epidemic is inherently an invisible disaster. Yeah. Uh, the action consists of people waiting around to get sick, as I said, <clears throat> and also then people performing uh, kind of fairly esoteric research or experiments <laughs> and like taking bloods and looking in microscopes and looking at slides and things like that and examining people, uh, which is, you know, then requires exposition for us to understand what they're doing. It It's very low energy in the, in the second I mean, act. You- uh, for a film that starts very high, starts and finishes very high energy, yeah. it it's definitely you the could, mid section of the film is not strong. You could definitely remake this film though, um, and you could dramatize those sequences in very compelling ways. I think because you wouldn't need the corny exposition, right? Because you know biological, you know uh, the biological effects of that kind of like infection are are now a thing, right? Like they're part of an everyday fear anyway in terms of like you know biochemical terrorism or whatever else um and you could you know yeah. i could i could imagine this film working uh as a as a, a, a in a remake sure i mean you still when somebody looks when a scientist or a doctor looks into a microscope and looks mm-hmm. at a blood sample or whatever you still do need you do need your hand held, you know, you need them to say what this means. Well, we'll come back you know? to that in a in a very funny moment in Leviathan. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um. Yeah, but yeah, it's, I mean, that's always always a thing. It's just, it's just a, the inherent issue of, like, you know, you can certainly make compelling films. I mean, have you seen Outbreak? Uh, no. With Dustin Hoffman? Yeah, uh, Dustin Hoffman, like that, yeah. that, that, that turns, that's a movie that I've, I, you know, saw as a kid and I've seen a lot. Uh, and it, it also, it also gets very silly, but it's also quite sprawling in its depiction of this outbreak. Uh, yeah. So it doesn't have that sort of, uh, oh, we're actually just stuck on a train waiting to get sick. You yeah. know, it, the, 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 the train thing, I don't know, it just doesn't really work. Um, and it, it's, it's the, like the, the reason that it's a train is because you want the race against time at the end with the Cassandra crossing. Sure. Um, yeah. You know. Yeah, Although it would be I, any better if it was a ship or something with people, everybody getting sick on a ship. It's, yeah, sure. No, I mean, like, I, I like, um, I like, well, ostensibly train bound thrillers. Yeah, that's, I was really excited to watch this. Yeah. I thought that, um, that sounds great. Yeah. Um, amazing. Yeah. Um, and I don't think it's bad. I don't think it's a bad film. No, I don't think it's bad. Uh, I actually, I actually would, would come down, I, I gave it a six out of 10. So I, okay. I, I kind of liked it. Six out of 10 chances of surviving the plague. 
Isn't that yes. the uh, probability <laughs> that you just mentioned? Yeah, that's um, the sixty percent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mine, mine would also be a mine would also be a six. Although I do think the high points of the film, but for that middle segment, you know, the high points are kind of great. I mean, like that that shocking, very impressive finale of the train, like you know, and the bridge collapsing. Hmm. I, like I watched it a few times actually, and I was like, "Wow, that's like really, really well Very done." Very well done, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know what scale miniatures they used for that, do you know? Mm, I don't know. I was trying to figure out with like so similar with you, um, similar to you. Sorry for Towering Inferno when you were trying to gauge by the size of the flames on the models. I was trying to gauge it by the yeah. size of the splashes in the water, the and splashes, I couldn't yeah, quite yeah. do it. But yeah. uh, Ron Goodman shot the aerial views of this film as well on Wescam. Uh, the aerial shots uh, directed by Kazmatos but shot by Ron Goodman. That's a trivia for you. Some some trivia. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Okay. All right. Well, once again, uh, I came up empty handed uh, after my dive into the variety and Hollywood Reporter archives, which once you go back to the 70s, they're just so incomplete. Um, so his fourth film was 1979's Escape to Athena. <laughs> Uh... Well, it looks like transmitting equipment to me. For a bunch of monks? wonder what they do with it. Maybe they got an early morning talk show. Morning, folks. This is Brother Zoltos speaking to you on orthodoxy or high altitude. Well, the Germans must have some sort of installation in the monastery. Oh, ho, ho. well, at least try to sound surprised. Are you saying he, that... He's saying you took us all the way up here for reasons that have nothing to do with what we're looking for. Right. So am I. All right. They have a communication center there. When they find out that something is wrong down there, they're going to radio for help. We have to knock it out. How many men are in there? Oh, there can't be too many. I suppose you worked out some sort of plan, huh? Ah, carefully. We ought to throw you down the mountain. And then you wouldn't get your golden plates. My golden plates. Something happens to me. Twenty years from now, when the Germans are selling Volkswagen all over the world, I'm going to be very angry, Zeno. You know. yeah. Okay, so Escape to Athena was released in 1979, produced by Jack Viner and David Niven Jr. for Lou Grade's ITC Entertainment, distributed by Associated Fulham Distribution and written by Edward Anholt and Richard S. Locht. Um, it's set in 19. It's set in a 1944 German prisoner of war camp in uh, once again the Greek islands. And stars Roger Moore as Otto Hecht, an Austrian Wehrmacht commandant, former antiques dealer, uh, who runs the camp as an antiquarian reclamation unit. Um, among his prisoners are Professor Blake, played by David Niven, uh, the producer's dad, uh, who's also an archaeologist. Sergeant Judson, played by Richard Roundtree, an amateur magician. Um, an Italian chef, Bruno Rotelli, played by Sonny Bono. And then the cast is completed, uh, I suppose, by the presence of Zeno, the island's resistance leader, Telly Savalas, uh, his girlfriend, Eline, uh, El- Ele- Eliana, sorry, uh, played by Claudia Cardinal, and then two United Service Organization performers, a stripper named Dottie Del Mar, played by Stephanie Powers, and a comedian called Charlie Dane, by, um, played by Elliot Gould. Now, I'm not sure how Dottie Del Mar and Charlie Dane come to be prisoners at this prisoner of war camp, uh, but suffice to say, they play an important part in the local resistance efforts to firstly take over the prisoner of war camp and then later mount an attack on a nearby hilltop garrison in order to assist an impending attack by the Allied forces. Hecht, uh, who, if you've just joined us, is played by Roger Moore, inevitably joins the forces uh with uh, joins forces sorry with uh Zeno's troops along the way and an action Fulham ensues I'll come just I'll come right out and say it. I think this is Cosmatos's weakest film um um it's uh, it, it, well well maybe we'll rank his films at the end but it's it's certainly not his best uh, yeah. Although I, thought, I saw I saw your rating for this. Like you watched it before me, and I saw it. And when I started it, I was like, "Oh, I'm actually going to like this." Yeah. I thought it was. I, I liked the tone of it at the beginning. Wow, I um, hated the tone of it at the beginning. 
Oh, really? I found it. I found that the tone was distracting from was distracting me from even following it on a scene to scene plot level. I was like, "What the fuck is going on here?" Like, I found it really, really difficult to orient myself. Like, tonally so jarring. Like this like implied hanging of island bells with like when the saints go marching in playing like this yeah. like, really <laughs> be tone it's like and it has this like, gorgeous like sweeping camera work yeah. this picturesque uh, yeah. these helicopter shots like circling around the the beautiful uh, architecture and landscape of the the island um and yeah the saints go marching in the buoyant music um and it's but it, i don't know it, it i liked that's kind of what i liked is that that uh, awkward um you know yeah, what you've just mentioned there, the the aerial view of the prisoner tr- attempting to escape through the town, and it's like done in this like really um, brilliant like what suggests long, itself as, as, long a, as a long take, yeah, pans yeah. and tilts and whatever else. Like, um, that's why they call him George Pan. <laughs> um, you know, it's quite amazing. But uh, before he became George George Tilt, um, <laughs> it's. Yeah, I mean, it it kind of falls apart for me as soon as like Roger Moore is introduced. Like Roger Moore is a is a Wehrmacht officer. Like, yeah, I was surprised. I did, I thought he was going to be like a British. Yeah, he'd be I, in, I, uh, even even when he even when he showed up in the Nazi uniform, I thought, oh, he's undercover. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. He that's, should really be doing a better German accent. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I totally agree. But like, so did you did you think this was funny at all? I don't find it funny. Like, so, you know, Elliot Gould, um, with us again from California split from a few episodes ago. When, when Gould shows up, I'm like, Oh, here we go. This is where like the phone begins and all that. I just like hanging around with like, you know, baseball, like varsity jacket and a Yankees baseball cap. I'm just like, it's like from a different film, man. It just doesn't meld together at all for me. Did you find it funny? I found parts of it quite funny. Yeah. The the first time I laughed was when the kid runs up to the Nazis in the car and knocks on the window and they roll it down and he just spits in their face and runs away. He actually, res- but that actually results in uh, that actually results in the hanging of the old man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and they have uh, this. Is she, she's not a stripper, is she? Well, she no. does perform a strip tease at one point, yeah, but I yeah. think she's she's like a, she's does some sort of diving performances or yeah, something like that. She's an underwa- much, underwater yeah. dancer or something like that. Whatever she is, uh, there's a, a very funny gag where she walks around the corner and there are these guys and they're like one guy is on crutches and he just like <laughs> drops the crutches and walks after her. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I thought there was some nice visual humor in it, um, and like the the lookout like leering at her and uh, when uh, you know Pierce, I, don't know, I was gonna say Pierce Brosnan, Roger Moore, <laughs> <laughs> one of the one of those James Bond guys, uh, he. <laughs> He like suddenly looks up at the the guard tower and the and the guard is like leering over the over yeah. the uh, the edge of the other. Um, You've also got the or like uh, the, the or when when they when they when they put the the laxative in the in the uh, is it in the food or the drink or whatever to send all the mm. the guards to the toilets and one of them runs into the cubicle and run <laughs> realizes there's no toilet paper and runs out and goes to grab the toilet paper and, and somebody runs in behind him. Uh, yeah, no, I thought it was. It's weird, right? Because, like, you've got this, like, horrible historical situation very familiar to us through dramatic scenarios and depictions of it. So, ostensibly, you know, a lighter tone might be refreshing. And you've got the dark undercurrents, I suppose. And I don't know if Cosmatos is responsible for nailing those because of his, you know, uh, Greek uh, Greek heritage um, and his, you know, other... other f- experience and working with that kind of material but then you've got like the script operating or trying to operate on another level above that alongside it and it just doesn't really go for me at all and a large part of that might be down to like this seemingly star-studded cast but actually like at least from i don't know if from the contemporary point of view if they were deemed to be like kind of you know over the hill performers Mm. but like for me, it's just like I mean, Roger Moore as as he has as much presence as like a fucking pencil for me. Just and you know, he's the weakest in general. Or in this? Yeah, yeah, just oh, okay, in general. Right, right, like yeah. I've never found Moore to have any kind of presence at all. David Niven, I mean, as an action 
star. I mean, like playing an archaeologist here. I mean, Richard Roundtree's underused. Like Gould, you've got Telly Savalas who playing Telly Savalas as you know Zeno, yeah. the, and the, it, the resistance guy. Yeah. I've never been a fan of those kinds of films with like a motley crew having fun with their like action packed violence. I've just like Kelly's heroes and the Dirty Dozen and all that kind of stuff. But, but do you not like what about what about stuff like? Are you, are you talking about Men on a Mission movies? Like, do, yeah. What do you think of Where Eagles Dare? So I love Where Eagles Dare. I wrote about it for Playboy magazine many, many moons ago. Like, I love Where Eagles Dare, but that's like a textbook, like a high example of a genre that I don't partic- respond to particularly well. It's weird. Okay. And also um, the star power of those films and the relationships between the characters are amazing. Like Burton and Eastwood in that film have borderline homoerotic tension between them, which just makes the... It, it's it, it kind of enriches the action here. I'm just like, what's what's Niven what's Niven doing with Gould and Roundtree and like Savalas? Like, ah, it just doesn't yeah, feel like no. it's like they wanted to make that kind of film, but could only scramble together stars who were either pre-peak or post-peak, and not stars at their peak. For me, yeah. Uh... However, okay. um, <laughs> however, however, no, I, I agree. I agree that the film is a complete, like, sprawling, weird mess. Uh, <laughs> it's lots. It's lots of lots of bits and elements and uh, genre tropes. It feels extraordinarily non-committal. You know, yeah. it starts off as a prison break movie, and then it becomes this kind of like resistance movie, and then it suddenly it becomes like a men on a mission movie where they have to go yeah. up and take this monastery at the top of the mountain, and it's just like. And meanwhile, you know, the the plot becomes fractured and everybody is off doing various different kind of yeah. minor cleanup operations because they've discovered that there's this uh, U-boat that's supposed yeah. to be passing by or docking or whatever and they need to make sure that that doesn't happen. So that some of them are going up to disable the communication center in the monastery on the mountain and some people are going to blow up the <laughs> refinery or something like that. To, like Whatever they're doing, it, it just feels like busy work. Sure. You know, it feels like oh, we've already accomplished our mission. We've already taken the island, and now we need to do these little kind of like we need to just mop up. Um, it feels very bitty, uh, and uh, so you have the whole like the action scene with the frogman who like kind of slipped through the oh, net, yeah. and they're yeah. yeah, so they're they're um, fighting with the frogman down by the beach, and meanwhile the others are up at the monastery taking the most poorly defended fortress in the history of cinema. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you have like nothing, nothing feels fully articulated. Nothing is all that compelling or satisfying. And what you do have is like some nice details, which I think I've actually noticed that throughout all of Cosmatis's films is that there always are like nice little details. Yeah. Um, in the way that he puts the scenes together. I think that there's some nice comedy, not all of it lands and none of it is like hysterically funny, but I do think there are some good jokes in here. Some of the action is very well directed, some nice visuals, uh, striking shot compositions. And, and again, like a kind of like an affable sort of tone to it as well. That yeah. I, I find it hard to like take offense to, you know, it's, I mean, I know that you said that you find the tones clash. I didn't really find that. I kind of got the hanging thing at the beginning. It's a bit too dark maybe, but, uh, the rest of it is very kind of like light and breezy. Um, and, Everybody looks like they're on holiday. It kind of reminded me That's a little it, bit of like, yeah. It kind of reminded me a little bit of like the Soderbergh's Ocean's Eleven movies, particularly the the second one, where mm-hmm. it's just like, oh wow, this is this is just an excuse for George Clooney and Brad Pitt and Matt Damon to go and on holiday and hang out together. And I was yeah. thinking of that line and uh, that uh, Michael Caine famously said about Jaws: The Revenge. You know, it's just like, yeah, I just took the took the job to have a holiday in the Bahamas. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. But it's. The biggest problem for me with the movie is how ridiculously easy everything is. Like, everything is way too easy breezy, you know? It's like, uh, even when the, even, so even when the elements of the scenes are appealing, so like the, I think the, the most promising, uh, scenario in the film is the infiltration of the monastery on top of the mountain. Yeah. Uh, but even that is like, they're, they never feel like they're in any kind of peril. There's no tension at all because no, every just... single guard that they come up against, every single challenge that faces them, it's resolved so easily. It's uh, like uh... And we we mentioned in, in Cassandra Crossing, like a doctor becomes this commando. 
Elliot Gould is like a comedian and um, Richard Rantry is like a magician or something like that and uh, uh, David so, Niven is yeah, what an archaeologist and they become these like crack yeah. commandos <laughs> <laughs> and like you know the scene with the, the motorbike chase which is also a very well directed action scene yeah, it's I thought great. It's a standout sequence. Uh, very visually kinetic and exciting where Elliot Gould suddenly becomes this like ace driver and crack shot yeah. you know why <laughs> so, know. but there's in, in a way that's kind of appealing though it's in a way it's kind of like charming that the the filmmakers are that kind of like generous and optimistic about people's potential ability to perform in these situations there's something kind of like naively charming about it, but it, it uh, feels particularly like... that, that meshes with the tone of this film more so than Cassandra but it feels like um, a, a spoof that's unaware of itself as a spoof in the same way that Roger Moore's James mm. Bond films did. Because Moore's like visibly like wooden. He's not a great action performer um, and it limits it limits him in terms of what he can do. And, and I think the same can be said for Niven. Like Gould physically has that potential yeah sure i mean he's young enough in it but like he he's he doesn't have that kind of presence he's not a natural he's not a natural performer in that way um and i think the the reason why the the bike sequence the bike chase is is the standout is because it's a it's a chase so you can edit that and you can get a real visceral energy to it Without needing, mm. without there needing to be any sort of like acrobatics performed, although obviously the bike is going over washing lanes and everything, yeah. um, so it's not like a physical combat that's stretching credulity. It's something sure. that's in the actual purely cinematic grammar of the sequence. But um, yeah. I, you know, it just feels like a a film that had a, torn between. I can't, I'm torn between saying having too big a budget. And lazily padded out, or not a big enough budget to acquire the store value that a production like this perhaps needs. I don't know. It's just weird. It just fe- it feels would you, like. Would you have preferred? I, I thought that the the premise of this movie would focus on completely amoral, apolitical uh, looters and like treasure hunters who were yeah. taking advantage of a resistance uprising to loot a monastery, yeah. and like you think kind of that that's where it's going to go, but then they all sort of get drawn into this very kind of righteous crusade against Nazism and for, for Greece and for the Greek people, um, which I was disappointed by. Cause I mean, you can, you could certainly do both. You could certainly background that kind of thing, uh, to, to refer to a film with a really very, very different tone. But in son of Saul, uh, the, the main character is doing something, uh, that is, you know, he's on a very personal crusade, mm. but it's all within the context of this uprising within the camp, mm. um, you know, that is backgrounded. And I kind of, I didn't expect this to be like Son of Saul, but I kind of expected to see all the resistance stuff going on in the background. Mm. Um, but instead, it, the the treasure hunters, the looters all sort of get kind of tricked almost into participating in it. Yeah, and I feel um, like, and I feel like a Fulham... You know, 1979, I feel like it's a film made at the tail end of a genre and rather than being made in and amongst it. And it feels like the kind of film that's made in the wake of something rather than like... I've just said the same thing twice, <laughs> but like the phrase differently. But you know what I mean? Like it's, it's just... Ah, it just doesn't really feel in any way engaging or... I mean, I didn't hate it though. Having said that, I I I found it just just funny enough, just affable enough. I wouldn't, but like I, I you know, this inevitably happens when you like or dislike something yeah. more than someone else. I feel like I'm, I feel like I liked the film. I feel like I'm coming across as though I liked the yeah, film. And, I wouldn't yeah. go that far. I, I gave it, I gave it a five out of ten. Yeah, you know, so, so it's it's, it's not. I, I I wouldn't say that I liked it, but I also wouldn't say that I disliked it. Yeah, well, it's a five it's for in that me. Liminal it's a five space for me as well. But you sound like you disliked it. Well, exactly. So inevitably, I'm coming across as like some hater. But I, I suppose, I opened proceedings with this is his weakest film, which doesn't necessarily mean it's terrible. But would you, would you say, would you say that you dislike this? <sighs> no, because if I did, I would have to be a four. Yeah, but that's what I'm but asking. In, in, <laughs> you know, because I would not. Would you give, say? I, no, I give it a five. Um, okay. I will say this: it's of all the of all the ten features I've watched in preparation for this episode. It's the one I remember least. 
and you know I'm 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 talking about it like days mm. after watching it, right? I took notes on it. I can't remember yeah. like certain sequences in it. So maybe maybe it was the mood I watched it in, something like that, but I don't think it was. I honestly think it's just so unmemorable in large stretches of it. Despite mm-hmm. standout moments that are stand out because they're so disproportionately brilliant. Um alongside yeah. everything else. But Roger Muaman, come on, jeez, how did people not realise that? You know, the guy just has no. I, I don't. I don't think I've. I don't think I've ever. Uh, was he? What are his Bond films? Oh God! Was he in Thunderball? No, no, no. That's Sean Connery. That's, that's the fourth. That's Connery. That's the yeah. fourth. No, uh, I don't think I've seen like any. Live and Let Die, Moonraker, uh, uh, to A View to a Kill with Christopher Walken. You've not seen that one with Grace Jones. I don't think so. Um, yeah. See a lot of these. Man a lot of the seventies and eighties. Oh yeah, no, I, I think I have seen that. But I'm, like a lot of the Bond movies from the sixties, seventies, particularly the sixties and seventies, and even the eighties, uh, if I've seen them, I've only seen them in part. Like I've seen like an hour of one on a Sunday afternoon or yeah. whatever, but I never sat down and watched all of them mm. or many of them even. So yeah, uh, I actually know Roger Moore probably best from uh, Boat Trip, <laughs> the Cuba Gooding Jr. comedy from oh, like right. two thousand two. Wow, uh, yeah. they used to be on Sky Movies all the time for some reason. Um, one thing I'm I'm not I wasn't able to confirm this, but the the sound of the alarm going off. Do you ever play Commandos, the yeah, PC yeah. strategy yeah, game yeah. from yeah, the, gr- the yeah, that gr- sound? It sounds exactly like it, and I wonder is it sampled from Do this you think film? It was sampled, right? Oh. Yeah, because it's it sounds like like when when the the alarm went off, it was like that's the alarm from Commandos. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so that's a five for both of us. It's weird that it's a five for yeah. both of us, and yet it seems to have been the segment on this episode so far where we've been most polarized. Such is the nature. Yeah, of the I whole wonder if you need more time to get to grips with your new rating system. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Should we move yeah. on? Let's move on. Oh, sorry. Actually, I wanted to say one more thing on that. Uh, the you know at the end of the film when they discovered that there's some sort of plot to use the. I can't even remember, to be honest. It's something to do with using the monastery as like a missile launching site or something like that. Yeah. Uh, There are these like stormtrooper type soldiers Mm. dressed in all black with these like blast visors that come out with with the missile. Um, The design of those soldiers is really strikingly reminiscent of uh, a design used in... Uh, Cosmatis' son's debut film, Beyond the Black Rainbow. Oh, right. Uh, for the... the I, can't, I can't remember. There's a figure in the facility where the film is set. It has exactly... I think he's red, not black, but he has a, the same kind of mask and everything. So it seems like that that was a you know homage to which, his father. Which, I'm from that, I'm presuming you've seen it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, right. I haven't seen it. Um, yeah. One last thing as well. You had one. I've got one. Uh, the The... I think this film is most famous for its in joke of having William Holden show up, show up for a line where Elliot Gould's like, "You're still here. What are you doing here?" Oh, yeah. Which is obviously a reference to Billy Wilder's uh, Stalag uh, Seventeen. Yeah. Okay. Uh, nothing to report yet again uh, between his uh, fourth film, Escape to Athena, and his fifth film, 1983's Of Unknown Origin. In the 14th century, the rat carried the bubonic plague flea that killed one out of every three people from India to Iceland. (laughs) Yeah, it's true. Can you believe that? The most horrible catastrophe in history. Over one-third the entire population of the civilized world destroyed by rats. Not bombs, not guns, but rats. You take your average rat, it can wriggle through a hole no bigger than a quarter, swim half a mile and tread water for three days. They can eat through lead and concrete with these teeth that are like chisels that exert an unbelievable 24,000 pounds per square inch per tooth. Really? Yeah. They can survive being flushed down a toilet and enter a building by the same route. They can fall five stories down to the ground, run off unharmed. And two rats, mind you, two, just two, give you 20 million rats in less than three years. And they say now there's as many rats on this planet now as people. You know, in this country, we kill them to get rid of them, but in some countries like the Philippines, they kill them because they have to, to eat them, because that's all there is. Stringy chicken. Stringy chicken? Yeah, that's what they say it tastes like, stringy chicken. And in some country, I don't know which one, they serve it as a delicacy, like chocolate-covered bees or caviar. 
A filthy rat on fine china. There's no accounting for taste, is there? And some places in Asia and India, they actually venerate them. They worship them. Can you imagine that? Priests set out bowls of honey and milk to pamper some animal's only contribution is famine, sickness, and death. Vermin. It's incredible. Incredible. Okay, so film number five, 1983's Of Unknown Origin, um, written by Brian Taggart, produced by Pierre David and Claude Hero, based on the, the novel The Visitor by John C. G. Parker III. Um, okay, so uh, mild-mannered everyman Bart Hughes, played by uh, Peter Weller, stays at home in his renovated New York townhouse uh, to work on a project for work uh, while his wife and child leave for a vacation. Um, in the hopes of, of, you know, scoring a promotion. Um, he soon discovers that the house uh, is in, well, I was going to say the house is infested. No, there is a rat in the house and he gradually becomes more and more fixated on uh, exterminating that rat to the point where he becomes obsessed and starts to lose his grip first on his life, his work, and eventually uh, his his mind um, and ends up destroying the house that he has just finished renovating. Um, the the four films that we've just discussed, uh, I think I had heard of the Cassandra Crossing before we settled on Cosmatus for this uh, for this episode, but this was the one that had been on my to see list for years. Mm. Uh, but I was completely wrong in my assumption about what this film was. I thought that it was going to be one of two things. I used the word infested there, and I thought Mm -hmm. that it was going to be something like a gradually escalating infestation of rats. You'd start with, because I mean, in the, in the clip that we just heard at the beginning of this segment, uh, he's talking about how two rats will give you X number of rats within whatever number of uh, years. Yeah. Um, I thought that it was going to be about that. It was going to be like, we'd, we'd start with a couple of rats and then eventually it would be like, you know, it would be like, you know, arachnophobia at the end with the house covered in spiders yeah. or whatever. I thought it was going to be something like that or that it was going to be, well, I don't know if I thought that's, that's what I thought it was going to be. But the other possibility was that it was going to be like a creature feature. Well, yeah. Like, yeah. uh, something like, something like Stephen King's graveyard shift where I haven't seen that since I was a kid, but I think at the end they end up underneath the factory and there's like a giant rat. Right, and like that's. I mean, the, of, the, the, so, so, the, I, the rats are fair size here, and it seems to get bigger as the film goes on. Yeah, but I mean, in Graveyard Shift, if I remember correctly, the rat's like the size of an elephant, so okay. <laughs> it's like a monster rat. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> this this never this never you know right. moves into that kind of uh, right territory, uh, but it is a large rat, right? Yeah. Um, so it's not like that at all. It's not a creature feature. It's not really. Um, it's a psychological horror film, right? It's about it's about the breakdown of this character's mind. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, it's it's very different. Well, so I it wasn't on my radar at all, right? Um, I didn't know it was about a rat. So halfway through the film, I began to make connections between what was happening in the in the house, uh, filmed in Canada, by the way, but set in New York. Um, what was happening in the house and then what was happening in this continuing increasingly jokey MacGuffin in terms of what's happening at work, this project that he's working on and the stress that he's feeling in relation to that being compounded by his increasing uh, obsession with the rat at home. Um, And at the start, when we start to see like, you know, the, the rat's paw, the tail slithering and all that business, I wasn't, even then, you know, I wasn't aware that it was going to be a rat. Um, So I had to adjust to the initial disappointment that it was something that was actually known. You know, the whole title, from the title, I presumed that it was going to be something far more sinister and less banal and everyday than a rat. I like the film, though. Yeah, I mean, the title of the novel that it's based on, The Visitor, Mm seems more appropriate to it of a non-origin feels like it's 
selling you something else. In fact, that's probably why I expected it to be an infestation film, like yeah. a natural horror infestation film where the infestation was of unknown origin. Yeah. As opposed to the title refer the title refers to the species. Yeah. Yeah, which is which know, is seen in the film. Species. Yeah, when he's because... researching it at the library, it, sure. it comes up yeah. of unknown origin. Which is which is very Jaws uh that that sequence where he's looking at, mm. you know, photos of the the wounds and things like yeah. that. Uh the rat is referred to as the lapdog of the devil. Um so how do you feel about rats? Well, I hate rats. I hate anything that can move faster than me, which is most things. Um, I mean, I don't, <laughs> I don't hate them as much as I hate snakes. Um, although, actually, yes, I do. Um, the idea of any creature that's smaller than me not being afraid is kind of terrifying. Um, I was once in Marseille having the most expensive pint of beer I've ever paid for money for. And I had the whole thing with a fucking giant rat just, like, watching me, like, very unshy, very <laughs> forthcoming. Um, and I just couldn't wait to finish off the beer. It's probably the fastest I've ever drunk a beer without, like, actually downing it. Um, like, I hate them. Do you? No, I like rats. Oh, fuck. I, so, like, I was... I'm I, think watching... rats are, I think rats are cute. Oh, um, God. Nah, I'm not having that. I'm like, not... I, I would have a pet rat. Nah, I'm not having that at all. Like, so I would have a pet this, rat, yeah. Watching this brought my mind back to arachnophobia which again another film that we've covered on the show um and i know you hate spiders see i don't hate i wouldn't sp- say that i hate spiders I'm, I'm afraid of spiders but i actually yeah, quite like them in a certain way okay. i don't i don't hate them and i don't okay. kill them you know yeah yeah right okay yeah. i get you um now nah, i would probably kill a rat with a shovel i remember the old uh, episodes of hail and pace when they would kill rats with shovels and have lots of fun with that now nah, i'm exaggerating i don't I know would... what i would do if i saw a rat in my own home um, yeah, it's, I, I mean that's that's kind of the thing. Like, that's see, like, like so. That's kind of one of the the ways that the metaphor in this film works quite well is that humans have built social uh, structures uh, in and around nature, mm-hmm. and that has, um, let's say, positioned certain animals. Uh, in such a way that they have become problems. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So, like, when you have rats in your house, you have to get rid of the rats. Mm-hmm. You know, no matter how you feel about rats, whether you hate them or you you like them, and like you would have a pet rat, but you can't have a rat infestation in your house. Mm-hmm. Um. So then the question is, well, like, how do you get rid of them? Uh. And I I I like that idea. You know, like like we heard in the clip where he's he's talking about like the all, everything that he's learned about about rats and. Uh, you know, the way that rats are treated in different cultures and, you know, um, how they destroy X amount of like grain in the, in the world yeah. and how they it's, carried the black plague and all that kind of thing. It's hilarious um, sequence at dinner when uh, he's with colleagues yeah. of, is it, is it, it mm. is colleagues, right? And, um, yeah, it's his work colleagues. Yeah. Right? And he's just ex- like, ex- like reciting verbatim all of the facts that he's learned about them. And one by yeah. one, we get cutaways to them all just like going off their food or like just being completely <laughs> freaked out. It's yeah. a very funny film. Yeah, it's a kind of a it's a kind of a psychological horror, dark comedy mixture. Yeah, sure. yeah. Uh, well um, as magnificent in it. Um, but I, one thing, so I watched it, enjoyed it then began to read about it, and it really wasn't well received at the time. It's really weird. Like, uh, Hmm. this hokey, kind of, you know, B-grade production starring this great actor, Peter Weller, and, like, a bit of amusement as to how it all came about. And from that, seems to have been largely forgotten. I mean, you know? Yeah. It's weird, uh, because... It's it's an extremely well crafted Fulham, very sort of old fashioned in the way it builds tension and the way it um you know, suggests that there's a creature in the home long before he realizes that there is one. Um you know, I love those kind of comic personifications of a creature as if it has an agenda. Like so we mentioned it as well mm. in relation to the spiders and arachnophobia, like where you get like close ups of the eyes and like almost like yeah. empathic, you know, coolish of effect cutaways to like the spider are like, mm. oh and like it's yeah, yeah, there's the same thing, but the, the rat's just like so like vicious, like persistently like 
one, but almost I read it at one point like it just wants to be pals with him, you know, like in the same way. See, that that's, a dog that's would. funny because <laughs> when when you like in, in arachnophobia when it cuts to the spider watching him and the reflection of the fire in the spider's eyes yeah. and things like that, that makes me kind of go, Ooh. yeah, uh, yeah. Whereas when it cuts to the rat's face in this, I go, ah, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah. So the 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 rat thing doesn't. Uh, I don't have a. I don't have that rat rat phobia at all. Um, There's a person, but I get. I get. I get their use. Yeah, I get. I get the use of the rat as a as a metaphor in this way, um, as the problem animal, and the way that he's kind of built this this structure, this house, you know, and mm. uh, has to destroy it to get rid of to get rid of it. Um, it reminded me a little bit of. Um, the film with Thomas Jane from last year, 1922, based on the Stephen King uh, novella, I think, where rats are used in a similar kind of way to represent um, the character's guilt over the murder of his wife. But the rats are uh, kind of coming from everywhere. They start coming, kind of coming through the walls, and it's a uh, it's a different sort of use. But that's kind of what I expected this. Mm. That's kind of the place that I expected this to go. I, I was surprised as the film went on when I realized that there was never going to be more than one rat. Mm. Um, I really didn't like. I was very, very like. I really thought sitting down to this that it was going to be natural horror, uh, mm. bordering on creature feature, and it is very much just a psychological horror thing. It's like a lone person going crazy in their home, mm. um, which is kind of reminiscent of like you know Roman Polanski's apartment trilogy. Well, not not really Rosemary's Baby, but like The Tenant and Repulsion, or The Shining. You know, uh, mm. the character locked in a in an isolated space, and the space kind of becoming like we've I keep saying this, but like an externalization of the character's uh, deteriorating mental state. Mm. Um, so he starts to destroy his house, and he has a model of his house inside his house. And at the end, when yeah, he finally like does that. kill the rat, he destroys the model as well. Yeah. Um, it also reminded me a little bit of Caddyshack, <laughs> you know, where I there's a subplot Caddyshack. with Bill Murray. Oh, really? No. Bill Murray spends the whole film uh, trying to exterminate a gopher who's destroying the golf courses. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, he, he's also reading Moby Dick in this, isn't he? Yes, we had... The, At one yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, Moby... Like, you know, Ahab obsessed with the whale and, and this character obsessed with the wrath. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's really good. And I, I like the... Um, the way that it sort of de-escalates in a way, it's like he he's very kind of proactively trying to do everything that a normal person would do mm. to to solve a rat problem with poison and traps and things like that. Uh, but toward the end, when he's destroyed half the house, he just like gives up and goes to sleep in the hammock. <laughs> you know, it's like that's enough of that. Yeah, and uh, he doesn't have time. It's, it's pretty funny. He doesn't have time in which to clear up the house either, because we hear the his wife and uh, yeah child return and she's like what did you do yeah oh i had a i what did you say i had a party i think she asked him did he have a party oh yeah or not he say that he has a party kevin look what you did Uh, to my room (laughs) (laughs) i love the scenes when he keeps going into work and his boss is just like yeah please don't please don't let anybody see you like this (laughs) because he's just like increasingly disheveled and really like rather ill looking and like when he's going down the escalator and somebody just says like yeah you haven't done your tie up something like that and I, mm. I like maybe could do with a little bit more of that, like the the work stuff, because um, you know the, it's, sure. the, they the they unfold in tandem, and I think it works really well. But I, as the film develops, and I I realize more and more that the rat thing is just a rat thing, I maybe would respond a little bit more to the to the work stuff, a bit mm-hmm. more, because um, in the at, yeah. at the beginning, you know, it's the frequency frames us in as to the relevance to the story but as it develops it then uh, maybe could be developed a little bit further I don't know but uh, no it's 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 a good film and I, I really don't get as I say I don't get why it's so critically forgotten or, or der- not not derided just like not given any time of day really um, mm. which is weird I wouldn't be surprised if it falls in a kind of an uncomfortable middle ground between kind of like presenting itself as a natural horror mm. infestation film creature feature on the one hand with that kind of like lurid title uh and even the the uh like the tagline is 
if it can't scare them to death, it will find another way. Yeah, it's just so you know, that doesn't apply to the content <laughs> at all. Like the the film is the film is very much like using the rat as a metaphor for his mental breakdown, and is much more in the in the tradition of like something like repulsion. Yeah, you know, uh, much more so than the creature feature that it presents itself as. So maybe people who approach it like I did, as uh, you know, this is going to be like a gruesome sort of infestation film. Um, maybe they don't respond well to it. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I just also happen to like the f- type of film that it turned out to be. So might we also? Uh, and then maybe yeah. sorry. And then maybe it's on the other hand, isn't kind of regarded as being of the same sort of pedigree as like a Polanski film. Mm. You know. Yeah, on the grounds that the director isn't an auteur yeah, sure. who you can then relate. You know, you can't relate this film very easily to something like Escape to Athena, uh, for instance. No. Um, might we also situate it in a very tertiary way within the burgeoning uh, home invasion film? Uh, sure. So it's an underrated film. Is it a seven? I'm guessing for you or an eight? Uh, it's an eight for me. Okay, it's a seven for me. All right. Okay, so uh, somewhat surprisingly, I I still couldn't find any information on on anything that he was doing in between of unknown origin and his next film. Uh, which kind of catapulted him into the big leagues. Um, Rambo, First Blood, Part 2. It was a lie, wasn't it? Just like the whole damn war. It was a lie. What are you talking about? That camp was supposed to be empty. Rambo goes in, a decorated vet. He finds no POW as the Congress buys it. Case closed. And if he happens to get caught, nobody knows he's alive except you and your computers. And you can reprogram that, can't you? Who in the hell do you think you're talking to, Trapman? A stinking bureaucrat that's trying to cover his ass. No, not just mine, Troutman. We're talking about a nation's. Besides, it was your hero's fault. Now, if your warrior had gone in, then what the hell he was supposed to do, we'd be out of this clean and simple. He was just supposed to take pictures. And if those pictures showed something, they would have been lost, wouldn't they? Ah, Troutman, I still don't think you understand what this is all about. Same as it always is. Money. In 72, we were supposed to pay the Kong four and a half billion in war reparations. We reneged. They kept the POWs. And you're doing the same thing all over again. And what the hell would you do, Troutman? Pay blackmail money to ransom our own men and finance the war effort against our allies? What if some burnout POW shows up on the six o'clock news? What do you want to do? Start the war all over again? You want to bomb Hanoi? Want everybody screaming for armed invasion? You think somebody's going to get up on the floor of the United States Senate and ask for billions of dollars for a couple of forgotten ghosts? Men, goddammit! Men who fought for the country! That's enough! Troutman, I'm going to forget this conversation ever took place. You bastard. And if I were you... I'd never make the mistake of bringing this subject up again. You're the one who's making the mistake. Yeah, what mistake? Rambo. Okay, so Rambo First Blood Part 2 was released in 1985, written by Sylvester Stallone, its star with James Cameron, and based on a story by Kevin Jarre, uh, produced by Buzz Feichens for Coralco Pictures. At the start of the film... Vietnam War veteran John Rambo, last seen on cinema screens in Ted Kotcheff's 1982 film First Blood, is released from prison by Federal Order and, recruited by his old trusted superior Colonel Trunkman, played by Richard Krenner, on behalf of US government official Marshal Murdoch, Charles Napier, um, he is tasked uh, to, well, he's tasked with a reconnaissance mission behind the former enemy lines in Vietnam, uh, Vietnam War now over, of course, well over, uh, regarding a potential prisoner of war camp still holding missing in action US soldiers. Rambo being Rambo upon finding the camp and discovering that the prisoners are being held captive in uh, like wartime conditions, etc., rescues one of them uh, and is himself captured along the way after Murdoch orders his extraction to be aborted. Um, and falls prey, Rambo, to the Soviets, or more specifically to Lieutenant Colonel Podovsky, played by Stephen Berghoff. And so he has to fight his own way out of the base, um, etc., etc. This is a film I knew from childhood, dating back to when I first discovered First Blood, um, which uh, I watched with my dad, who was also a fan of that film. Uh, and <laughs> as it, it's weird, because as a, as a youngin', I used to like prefer the Rambo sequels, to Kotcheff's mm-hmm. yeah. uh, original, 
Now I feel that Cut Chefs is a masterpiece and I haven't seen Rambo 3 in many, many years. I suspect I wouldn't like it as much, if at all. I've always had a... And, and, I, and I didn't like... Uh, was it just Rambo, the fourth one? Yeah. Yeah, just Rambo. I didn't like that at all. Like, I hated that film. Well, well overdue a rewatch uh, now that my more regressive political side has been unearthed. We're getting the fifth one as well. Oh, yeah, we're getting a fifth one. shooting um, in, uh, in September, I think. Yeah, that's right. Um, but over the years, right, although I've mellowed on the sequels, hated the fourth one, I've always had a soft spot for the second. Mm-hmm. Um, and I like this a great deal, actually. It's set against the backdrop of, well, it doesn't really have a specific name, right? This period of this sort of post-Vietnam period where U.S. relations in Vietnamese, with the Vietnamese you know, were, were, yeah. became relatively more peaceable and mm-hmm. it sort of uh, attempts were made to sort of open up the territory in order to, you know, extract prisoners of war, etc., etc. those missing in action, presumed dead, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Do you know I I, I saw about that? I saw this once years ago, but not as a kid. I didn't see it as a kid. I saw mm. it maybe when I was, I don't know, in my mid-20s early 20s maybe right. i don't know i saw two and three pretty close together and i went back and watched both of them again before this uh and i liked this more than i remembered liking it i if, if memory serves i watched it when i was kind of sleepy <laughs> which i know you did as well for this for this as well <laughs> i'll come okay so full confession on here now i am um, i got in uh from having comfortably proceeded through double digits tallies of uh, a double digit tally of Guinness pint of Guinness and uh, I thought it would be a good idea to you know uh, continue the evening when I got in by watching doubling up with some homework for the Habitus by watching or re-watching Rambo 2 first 40 minutes I'm thinking this is absolutely amazing like wow what a film how have I been like you know have I, how have I not championed this to the degree that it obviously deserves to be all these years and then next thing I know, I wake up on the bed, uh, <laughs> laptop still on, still open, full and long finished, and I don't really remember what point. At that at that time when I wake up, I don't know at what point I nodded off. So then the next day I had to rewatch it, of course. Um, and, well, I don't think it's, you know, the masterpiece that I thought it was after having 12 or so Guinnesses. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's weird. It's it's a weird one. I really like it. Like it, not not much seems to happen. Like, well, in in, in, in relation to what you asked me packed. before, sorry. The when when I when I watched it, uh, the first thing that I sort of thought of and asked myself was, like, what's the truth behind this? Because I had never heard mm. of this this notion of, you know, prisoners of war in Vietnam in the mid eighties. You know, when American yeah. involvement in in the Vietnam conflict ended in 1973 you know sure. you're talking about like 12 plus years in this like you know jungle prison uh, yeah. you know it's such a nightmarish prospect um, and on researching it like it's it's kind of it kind of falls into the kind of category of conspiracy theory that there's mm-hmm. like a you know the American government has colluded with the Vietnamese government to cover up the existence of these uh, POWs and MIAs um, but I don't know. I mean, there was a, an investigation into it in the early nineties that concluded that there's no evidence that these people exist. Uh, but who knows? Um, so the, the, the thing that struck me on a rewatch was cause I also rewatched first blood, which I agree is a really great film. I love that film. Um, is that first blood builds very, very, very slowly to its explosive action climax Mm-hmm. The opening shot of this film is an explosion when he's working mm. in the quarry. Uh, yeah. So it's like, you know, right from the get-go, it's going to be... It's it's almost as though in, in First Blood we're told so much about Rambo's prowess as a commando, or Green Bray rather, in yeah. Vietnam, that yeah. they want... like it's it's almost like doing a prequel without doing a prequel. It's like we want yeah, to see him... We yeah. want to see him doing that. Uh, so, well, we could do a prequel, we could, but you know, that would mean going back and set, like he should be like 15 years younger or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we'll just do a sequel. We'll send him in as this kind of like on this black ops mission, um, which is supposed to be a reconnaissance mission. He's not supposed to actually engage anybody, but obviously that doesn't pan out. 
Uh -huh. We were supposed to take photos. What about orders? <laughs> uh, yeah, and that's that's the other interesting thing that, that differentiates it from the first one is that in this one we see him paired up with somebody. He's yeah. not solo anymore. He's he's paired up with uh, a Vietnamese contact named uh, Ko, who uh, speaks in very artificial broken English, where she yes. just like om omits random like verbs and things like that. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, played by Julia Nixon, uh, right. one of the all-time great performances. Uh, yes, I fully agree. Um, what what's um? Yeah, also, actually, he's also saved by Co. At one point, yeah, which is you know yeah. like no nobody's there to save him in First Blood, so it's very much like we'll team him up with somebody. And it's the same in Rambo Three; he gets teamed up with uh, uh, some of the uh, Afghani uh, freedom fighters. Um, mm -hmm. So. Rambo 2 and 3 are interesting in the sense that they're both uh, effectively anti-communist films. They're both like in, they both set, they both put Rambo in the context of like, you know uh, a US Soviet Union proxy conflict Yeah. first yeah. in Vietnam and then in uh, in Afghanistan um, you know and, and Rambo 3 has this like the first half of Rambo 3 is pretty bad it's like it has this yeah. really almost like sanctimonious kind of uh, saccharine tone uh, mm -hmm. where it's like he's Rambo just hanging out with these like you know the the, the Afghani freedom fighters and showing you how like how great these people are and uh, one one thing that I probably respond less to about the second one than I do about the first one is the actual uh, setting and the feeling like so you've got like the the sort of the kind of lush alpine setting of like the Pacific Northwest in the first one. Sure. Which sure. is set in Oregon, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, and then this this one is like the kind of the humid, sweaty, you know, Southeast Asian jungle. Um, yeah. Which one appeals to you more? Oh definitely well I'm a I'm a city boy, so definitely the urban terrain um that that the first one climaxes in, but also yeah. that small town like, you know as you said, like uh mountainous terrain mm -hmm around that um basically any film so. any film set in that kind of setting immediately has an advantage with me so like like 80s 80s thrillers that i i like way more than the average person likes like things like shoot to kill aka deadly mm -hmm. pursuit with Sidney poitier mm -hmm. and tom berenger just the fact that it's set in that kind of landscape makes it a good film for me <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Uh, <laughs> I like my favorite episode of the x-files as well as darkness falls and it's all set in that kind of landscape but yeah uh I was I one like I love Predator, um, and I had never realized how much of a first blood cash in Predator is. Like it's it's really not sorry it's it's a it's a it's a Rambo cash in. So it's a it's a it sure, takes yeah. ele elements from uh, both First Blood and a lot from from uh, Rambo Two, like yeah, you like know, that's... In, in First Blood Part One where mm. the National Guard are coming into the forest to apprehend Rambo, and Rambo is, like, he's, yeah. he's doing the same thing that, that Arnold Schwarzenegger does. He's, like, creating these weird, like, booby traps out of the trees and, like, <laughs> spikes and all sorts yeah, of stuff. Yeah. That, and then there's also, in the second one, he... Uh, when he smothers mud over himself. Exactly, yeah, yeah, like, the, mud, the mud part, yeah. Disguises himself as part as an extension of the tree bark. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he's, like, uh, you know, I've written here, like, he's a trickster strategist. Like yeah. at the very end of the film, when he's in the helicopter, pretending to be asleep, <laughs> yes. like, pretending to be <laughs> pretending to be knocked unconscious, yeah. to be knocked unconscious, yeah. yeah that's great. Oh, yeah, suddenly grabs the bazooka in. Uh, you know, you got explosive arrows in this as well. Because we should say, like, so when he when he lands in the jungle, it's by mistake that his his parachute gets trapped, or or in the when he when he jumps out of the plane and he needs mm. to be cut free, and in doing so. They also cut free his equipment, so he's yeah, armed yeah, yeah. with very little. He's just got his, you know, trademark uh, knife, is yeah. which also gets a credit in the like knife design by such and such oh, really? credits, <laughs> and uh, and he has explosive arrows. Um, well, he acquires the explosive arrows, I think, somewhere along the way. But you know, the sequence where you know all hell's being let loose, like because Matos is on like a his his distillation of action space into images that are almost like tableau vivants like so you'll get like a almost like a still photograph of rambo 
with an arrow and then cut to a scene of it just fucking exploding. <laughs> it's quite like creative. And See, the scene where he shoots, he shoots the guy who's just standing on the rock, and it, <laughs> that's great. Uh, the action is great. The action is really impressive. In the way that the action scenes are constructed as like escalations, um, like this, mm. I, like the first really impressive one I think is the one on the boat on the on the boat on the river, with the, uh, with the other boat, coming with the other boat, and there's like this like logical yeah, yeah. kind of like. You know, because I mean, they 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 kill the people on the other boat, but then the but then the boat is you know unmanned but still moving, and then that becomes yeah. the new threat, and you have this escalation of the you know escalation to the boat exploding, and then then the helicopter arrives, and then mm-hmm. he starts using the explosive arrows. I think it's actually at the end of that scene where he shoots the guy, <laughs> blows him up. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Have you seen the the Chuck Norris films, uh, Missing in Action? Which no. I, I think did they come out before this? Or, I think they did. I think it's yeah. I think I think before? it's maybe the year I before it was this. After. Oh really? So, okay. Let me just check. I thought it was after. I thought it followed suit. No, yeah, the year before. Yeah. Okay. Eighty four. I haven't seen them either. Um, but uh, do, do do you you know like when when the carnage ensues in the final sort of se- well the climactic sequence, let's say. If, like it, it doesn't feel like, or it doesn't seem to be like a revenge film, or like even like a survival film in the in the mode that uh, the first one was operating in. But do you feel like, with when all of a sudden, like you know, he's in a he's in a helicopter and he's got a sudden, suddenly endless supply of villages and buildings to blow up. Um, do you feel like <laughs> his his like dormant trauma has been triggered? And it's just like a madman, or do you feel, or do you think that we're meant to be seeing a certain logic or purpose to his, to the violence? Uh, I definitely is think Rambo's Rambo a less, is... a less interesting character in this than he is in the first one. Oh yeah, um, like much, much less. Uh, and I, I think I, I, what, what kind of knocks the film down a notch for me is how kind of humorless it is. Like I know that it has it has gags, arguably gags like the the exploding arrow just completely detonating the guy. <laughs> yeah, uh, but Rambo himself, Stallone's performance in this is very kind of dull. I think it's 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 I pretty actually prefer him. First I actually prefer blood, him. Blood. No, but in First Blood, he's he's uh, the 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 context within which that's happening. I think it I think it works. You know, and mm-hmm. and he has he has like Brian Dennehy. Uh, you know, and a, and a greater presence from um, Richard Crenna as Troutman, you know, yeah. um, to offset that. But like, yeah, no, it's, it, I agree that in the first one, it is it's quite a it's a quite a muted and kind of one note sort of performance. But um, in this one, he's kind of asked to do more. Like he's he's asked to sort of cordially interact with Co and all that kind of stuff. And yeah. the, the romantic thing <laughs> toward the end. It's like, no, no. <laughs> It just doesn't yeah. work. And... But he, he um you know, she does make an impact on him because when she is uh, gunned down, he does mm. take her uh necklace and tie it around his own And neck. he has it in the third one, which is giving it to giving it to one of the Afghani an, kids. A nice touch. Oh, does he? Yeah. I forgot about that. Um no, I think you know, Stallone is still sort of finding his feet as a comic actor and obviously warming himself up for Cobra, which we'll get to, because uh, he's obviously very funny in that. But in this, yeah, you're right. He's there's no real humor. What do you make of um, Charles Napier as like the antagonist? Uh, because Dennehy's great in the first. I absolutely love Dennehy. I love his troops as well in the first. Like David Caruso, the very underrated David Caruso, Green Beret. Um, yeah, yeah, Napier's great as uh, Murdoch. I think. Like it's it, we're about halfway through the film when the Russians arrive. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, for I have forty nine minutes. Forty six, forty six minutes when Berkov shows up as Podovsky. I, I have forty nine. You must have watched the the TV edit. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, mean, I don't know. Berkoff, like, yeah, yeah, so I, yeah, I know. We don't I get the main antagonist I, until. Yeah, yeah, I know. I bring him up because I mentioned like Charles Napier as the antagonist. That like the the. You know the bureaucrat who ultimately is the cause of all of this. I mean, Berkoff is, of course, the one who needs to be blown up, uh, and he, I think he's great. I think he's like mint. Put it, put it in his eye. Um, 
but like Charles Napier as Murdoch back at base is the one is like mm-hmm. the scheming government official who machinates the aborted uh, excavation plan, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm. Uh, so what what would you give this? Um, I'd probably give it like a seven. Yeah, I like it, but it uh, like first blood for me is a nine, and the third one is a is a th- is a five. Uh, and yeah. I and the fourth one is a six, but I haven't okay. rewatched that. I'm gonna rewatch. I meant to rewatch it, but I didn't have time. Mm. Um, yeah, isn't it funny how? You know what? Never mind. Well, I, I, this is more relevant to Cobra, so we'll talk about that in the next. Segment. All right, let's move on. It's a seven for me as well, but yeah, I'm happy to move on. Okay, all right. So his uh, his next film uh, followed hot on the heels of Rambo two and reteamed him with Sylvester Stallone and was 1986's Cobra. We kill the weak, so the strong survive. You can't stop the new world. Your filthy society will never get rid of people like us. It's breeding them. We are the future. No. Your history. You won't do it, pig. You won't shoot. Murder is against the law. You have to take me in. If you can. Even I have rights. Don't I? Pig. Take me in. They'll say I'm insane. Won't they? Court is civilized, isn't it? Pig. But I'm not. This is where the law stops. And I start. Suck him. Okay, so Cobra, um, produced by Menahem Golan and Yoram Globus of uh, the infamous Canon Group. Um, who we, we talked a little bit about on our episode when we talked about um, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2. Uh, this is just becoming an advert for previous episodes. Uh, so this was this one was written by... <laughs> so this was written by Sylvester Stallone and based on the 1978 novel Fair Game by Paula Gosling. Um, so the basic setup here is uh, when traditional methods of police investigation into a series of mysterious killings in the Los Angeles area fails to yield any results uh, renegade loose cannon uh, cop Marion Cabretti also known as the Cobra is put on the case um, and ends up having to uh, protect and guard a, uh, a a witness a material witness to one of the killings um, and discovers that the people perpetrating the killings are involved in a mysterious cult of some kind. Uh, and that's more or less it, right? Yeah, an axe-wielding yeah. cult. Right. Um, so what I, I'll start with what I was going to say at the end of the previous segment, in that I think it's yeah. weird that Stallone, obviously, is not shy about making sequels and revisiting mm. his beloved characters. I wish that mm. this had had sequels. Um, like, I would happily mm-hmm. trade everything after Rocky 4, like, trade Rocky 5, 6, and 7 for Cobra 2, 3, and 4, you know? I would trade Rambo yeah. 4, I'd trade Rambo 3 and 4 for Cobra 2 and 3, you know? This is, yeah, this yeah, is, sure. this is such a great character, and it's such a great, um, like, the style of the film, uh, which I think is, was very influential on, like, Nicholas Winding Refn. Like there's a lot of that, like the, the mm. neon and yep. uh, the like high high color contrasts, and the synth score and everything like that. Um, and I think Stallone's really good in this. I think he's he's uh, yeah he's he's great. really really good. Um, and I love the the horror element as well. Like even like down to the like we have a character named the Night Slasher, 
we have this uh, weird cult who we never really learn that much about. Uh, we we no. like um, Cobra is part of something called the Zombie Squad, uh, which is like the yeah. bottom line, like the the last people you call, just like the kind of the blunt instruments <laughs> to to get the job done that no one else wants to do, and like all that kind of thing. Um, yeah, no, I'm I'm really really fond of this movie. Uh, I thought um, it was generally better thought of than it is. Um, I mean, it has a sort of cult following. Yeah, it's but a I thought cult, it was gen- cult flavor. But I, I thought it was gen- genuinely and generally uh, regarded as like a, an action eighties or an eighties action classic, um, and it isn't. No, it's weird because I, I, so I hadn't seen it before, um, and. I very much enjoyed it. I think Brian Thompson as a night slasher is terrific. Yeah. Um, Bridget Nielsen is amazing as uh, Ingrid, um, the witness in protection. Yeah. And I agree. Like Stallone has a you know a, a comic dimension yeah. here that kind of charisma and a, and, a, and a rapport with both Bridget Nielsen and with uh, with his partner uh, Gonzalez, played by yeah. uh, is that Rennie Santoni? Um, yeah. And I I know uh, Andrew. Sorry, is it? Brian, I know, I know Brian Thompson, uh, who plays the Night Slasher here as the uh, the alien bounty hunter from from the X Files, and I know Rennie Santoni from right. uh, Seinfeld from playing uh, uh, Poppy, the guy who owns the restaurant. Oh yeah! Um, oh yeah! So like, yeah, so that Jeez. little, uh, you know, amazing. Yeah, yeah, people who would go on to star in um, a couple of my favorite nineties shows, but. Yeah, no, he has a, he has a great rapport with him, and we got a lot of little like neat character details, like the you know, the feminine name when he re- reveals that his name is Marion, and I don't know, he plays it all really well, and there's a nice rapport between him and and Bridget Nielsen. Uh, with Gonzalez, we have this this whole thing where he's addicted to sugar, <laughs> he keeps he keeps eating like yeah. chocolate and candy and stuff. Um, let me ask you a question: Did this film make you want a Pepsi? Absolutely. I mean, yeah, it's. Uh, like, it, I mean, uh, you know, his partner's actually drinking Coca Cola in the scene that he tells uh, Bridget Nielsen that, to whisper something in Cobra's ear. Yeah. But the Pepsi signs, the Pepsi on signs the are block everywhere. The apartment block. Yeah. And big, I mean, there's, big there's Pepsi, vending, Pepsi machine. vending machines taking up half the frame, and it's it's. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a, a really that's an funny. amazing shot when he's when he's in the supermarket right at the beginning, like which is the scene that yeah. has no real bearing on the rest of the plot. No, it's like a character introduction character. scene. Yeah. Um, he, yeah, he guards himself from behind a Pepsi vending machine yeah. and, uh, what does he, he drinks a He drinks a Coors, yeah. <laughs> he actually yeah. stops and drinks a Coors. <laughs> I mean, like, a supermarket, <laughs> a supermarket is, uh, just, like, the perfect place. If you want to, if you, if you have, like, product placement deals with all these, <laughs> these companies, you know, yeah. there's no better place to set yeah. your opening action scene than a, than a supermarket. Absolutely. And at least you get your really, uh, fact- brazen product placement out of the way in the opening five minutes um but the fact that the pepsi uh neon sign is on his own apartment block as well it's amazing i mean that action sequence that takes place on that sort of balcony area but what about short i think it's actually shortly when he goes home after i think it's when he goes home after the supermarket thing and he cuts the pizza yeah. slice with the scissors and, and with the scissors, yeah. yeah but then he turns on the tv and we watch an entire mm. toys r us ad and then the news plays and gives yep. us the plot information yep. <laughs> i know <laughs> It's amazing. Um, you mentioned the the like neon and the influence on possibly probably uh, Reffin. I've actually heard Reffin, re- re- Reffin reference this film. Oh so yeah, it is. also it's yeah, confirmed, yeah. right? Right, but um, it like it's distilled into the Pepsi sign in particular because the whole thing has a like a blue pink uh, contrast. Like it's mm-hmm. like cyan and magenta. It's almost like um, like a graphic novel almost at times. Um, and it has a really, really beautiful, like steely cold palette with punctuated by like summery neon pinks. Um, it took my, actually from the opening images and opening scene in the film, I didn't realize it was LA set. Mm. Um, and I was enthralled to discover soon after that it was LA set. Cause like when we first start to see the exteriors, I thought, oh, it must be like Miami, Florida or something. But then it's obviously like, you know, um, uh, Santa Monica, and because um, I, you know, I've been to Los Angeles, I love the iconography there, but it underplays it as well. I mean, and as part of the plot, this witness protection plot, they also escape Los Angeles. They go upstate to San Remos, yeah. um, which there's a great action sequence there as well. That's incredibly tense. Um, 
when the, you know the climactic sequence, I guess, when they realise that they're going to be besieged by this whole horde of. Uh, yeah, um, we should say one of, one of the cult members is a police officer who is actually assigned to the case, yeah. um, and she's she calls in their lo- <laughs> calls in their location from the motel that they start, they're staying at. Um, but I'm a fan in general of um, like safe house milieus and uh, if that's such a thing, <laughs> um, and like and witness protection narratives, like um, you know the obvious one. I like a history witness, of violence. Um, <laughs> Right, fucking go back, <laughs> listeners, and listen to our history of violence segment on a few episodes back, and uh, listen to my segment long gaff resulting from a misreading of the film's plot. No, but uh, coming back to this, uh, yeah, you mentioned Officer Starks as the um, as the mole, if you like, the insider, um, who's the cop who is also part of this gang. Um, how she got into the being a cop, we'll never know. Um, how she got into the gang, we'll never know, but it's it adds just a real menace, that that kind of complication to this kind of plot, um, because there's a dramatic irony that we know that she's she's a villain. Yeah. Cobra kind of cottons onto the fact that something's not quite right yeah. in the restaurant or diner. In the diner, he starts food yeah, constantly, yeah, yeah. and then, and yeah, then, he, then and, he catches but, her. He catches her outside the motel in the middle of the night, yeah, making a call. But, it's, yeah. but all of that's heightened by. The the um, con- like uh, at the same time as that, uh, Bridget Nielsen and Stallone are beginning to develop some kind of rapport that he's trying to resist for professional reasons because he has a job at hand, and it just adds it adds to the stakes very well in a very economic fashion, an extremely economic film, by the way. I mean, the opening sequence lasts what like ten minutes, yeah. and the film is only eighty seven, yeah. so it's like seventy seven minutes time of plot there, um. Yeah, that's with credits. I mean, yeah. it's it's very it's yeah, very yeah, lean, uh, and that leads into my only criticism of the film is that I think it's probably too lean. Uh, like, I could definitely do with ten more minutes, giving us more time with the cult. You know, that's the only thing because, mm-hmm. like, when you, when you get to the end of the film in the in the foundry, um, and we have Brian Thompson, like as in the clip I just played there, uh, we hear his mm-hmm. confrontation with Cobra, and uh, yeah. You know, he's great he's voice. so great good. Voice. His voice is so great. Uh, the way he spits the word pig, uh, yeah. and pig. the way that he dies as well. Yeah. He's so gruesome and and excessive and and like brilliantly, uh, you know, symbolic. Where he's hoisted up and impaled on the on the hook, and the hook carries mm-hmm. him into what looks like the the mouth of the devil. Um, he's he's got carried into this like it's almost like he's fed to fed to his god or whatever we never we never find out who the cult is and that's the yeah. kind of the only problem for, with the film for me is that not necessarily because you need to know but because uh as as antagonists in a film like this it's extremely unusual generally the antagonist in a film like this whether like a rogue cop who's like you know a loose cannon they're going to be like, you know, drug dealers or gun runners or maybe terrorists or sure. something like that or crooked cops or something like that. This is this is like straight out of a horror film. Uh, here you have this sinister cult that worships something or other and has all these rituals and is performing what are effectively human sacrifices. Um, mm. And I think they they missed an opportunity here because if they had made sequels to this, you could have continued with that. You could have had a sort of horror-inflected action franchise with Sylvester Stallone where it would have been really unique you know and you could have continued that kind of really dark subject matter um, it's a pity uh, you wouldn't necessarily have had yeah. to have gone supernatural with it or anything like that but to keep sure, to keep sure. it in that kind of vein like maybe to do a serial killer story with uh, something you know more um, Silence of the Lambs style operatic kind of over the top horror you know I don't know it's, it seems yeah. like a bit of a missed opportunity because it was a hit yeah, as well. The movie wasn't a flop. I actually yeah. thought I thought that the reason that they didn't make sequels was that it was a flop. But it it only cost twenty five mm. million and it made one hundred and sixty million worldwide. So I guess they just maybe that was considered a disappointment after because Stallone was the biggest box office draw of nineteen eighty five because he had Rambo mm. two and Rocky four that year. Uh, so like he, he I don't know what they their combined gross was, but maybe Cobra was supposed to be kind of performing on that level and didn't. But it seems a bit unfair. It's it strange. I mean, uh, I uh, so early on, I was worrying a little bit because I, as much as I was enjoying the film, even in that opening scene, I much prefer Stallone, and I think he works best as an underdog. 
right? And to and to see him play an actual agent of the law seemed a bit odd and a bit strange. And so I I agree. I think the introduction of that kind of antagonist, mm-hmm. yeah, um, yeah. firstly a pervasive one, and secondly like a, a one that will go to weirdly uh, unprecedented or unhuman or inhumane levels of violence or whatever else. Mm. Uh, works to, works to the film's advantage in bringing Stallone around to something resembling not out of his depth, but the stakes. Yeah, yeah it's are, a challenge. You know, yeah. equal. Yeah, it's a challenge. Like yeah. we see him, the way that he deals with the the guy at the beginning in the opening scene, we see that like that's just not. It's not even. He's not going to break a sweat doing anything like sure. that. And yeah. you can imagine him. You can imagine that kind of situation being scaled up and up and up, and him still kind of mm. handling it pretty well, like a you know a warehouse full of drug dealers or whatever that kind of thing typical kind of mm. uh you know cop action thriller scenario he's a little yeah. bit too he's a, he's a little bit too larger than life for the standard mm. antagonist but i think that yeah um i also like the the rapport between uh stallone and andrew robinson in this who i know best as the scorpio killer from dirty harry and as the father from hellraiser uh who plays right. the who plays the basically plays his opposite within the police department he plays the by the yeah. book you know uh like <laughs> let's let's kind of take it take it softly and let's uh mm. try to minimize the body count and the property damage uh and they have this kind of like antagonistic relationship uh yeah it because it, like everything about the movie seems to be that it was like setting itself up for a series like the, even the fact that he has like a signature car you know, it's almost like mm-hmm. the Batmobile that has we we find out later in the excellent car chase. Uh, mm. The it even has like a nitrous nitrous boost thing, yeah, um, it like, and it has like f- fighter jet seat belts <laughs> and all this kind of stuff. Really, like they yeah, put a yeah. lot of effort into designing this car purely just mm. for the for this one uh, well, car chase. It, as it's and it's yeah. it's like like I said about the the action sequences in well in several of the films that we've talked about so far they're. Cosmatos is a great action director. Like he he constructs these action scenes and escalates them and fills them with little interesting details, uh, really expertly. And it's like the all of those details and like the the physicality, the 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 awareness of the physical, like heft and shape and uh, like body of the car, uh, the variation in like you know thinking thinking through the car chase sequence and thinking about all of the opportunities to do slightly different things with each kind of uh beat within the sequence and yeah, uh yeah. keeping all of it clear and you know not kind of um fundamentally confusing uh it's all he's he's uh, i really think he's a, an excellent and underrated action director i agree i you mentioned uh you know with regard to Drive. I'm presuming it was Drive that Refn said Cobra was an influence on. Um, or was it? I mean, it couldn't possibly have been Neon Demon or Only God Forgives, or maybe it was in terms of look. But, uh, um, I mean, in terms of just the synth and the neon and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I don't know. Sure. Yeah. Probably Drive from um, early. I don't know. I also wondered very early on if the you know the killing sequence uh, was a precursor to Zodiac. Where we just get like uh, like two or two or three uh, sequences of just the gang just like killing oh, yeah, people yeah, yeah. in their cars yeah. and stuff. Um, but also, you know, you mentioned because Matt also is a, is a wonderful action director. The all also the old fashioned economy with which he portrays like villains. You know, he's got the whole boot fetish thing going on, that Hitchcockian thing where like a, a, a villain will leave his car and we'll only see, we'll, the, you know, the camera angles will only show his boots entering mm. the store, etc., etc. You know, it's all like kind of nuts and bolts stuff, but it works, right? Yeah. Yeah. And just like that, that extra edge of nastiness to it as well, like that mid-80s, um, like... I don't know. I mean, it's very easy to throw terms around like this, but like this Reaganite sensationalism that gives rise to like police vigilantism. I mean, we haven't even touched upon like the the politics of the movie or anything like that. But you know, I mean, it 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 it's an exciting film about like a regressive institution, basically. Um, yeah. 
<laughs> so this is this is the first film. I mean, like, like, set. sorry, but the Andrew Robinson character, like I mentioned, he was the Scorpio killer in uh, yeah. Dirty Harry. I mean, like, Dirty Harry yeah. was well before the Reagan era, you know. Sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. And you mentioned Zodiac, like you know, obviously in Zodiac, the Scorpio course, killer is, yeah. mo- is modeled on the on the Zodiac killer, but yeah, um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> this is so. I guess this is the first eight I'm going to give on this episode. I'm guessing it's your second eight. It's my third eight after third eight. Mas- oh yeah, Masquerade uh, Rome, Masquerade Rome, Rome, Origin, yeah. and but yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So uh, I promise I will have some interesting tidbits about unproduced, unrealized projects very shortly, but I don't don't have them yet. Uh, so we'll move straight into his next film, 1989's Leviathan. It's growing. It's had a meal. It needs blood. Apparently. That's just great. You're telling me we got a goddamn Dracula in here with us? That's why the one on the ship was dead and needed blood. Wait a minute. What one on that ship? Somebody won't let the rank and file in on your little secret? Whatever it is, it appears to be a genetic aberration. No shit. What are you trying to tell us, Doc? It has all the characteristics of deep sea marine life. Scales, gills. Regeneration. Even a period of dormancy. But the fact that it remembered where that plasma was stored seems to imply that it has some, uh, some other quality. What? It absorbs the intelligence of its victim. Intelligence may not be the right word. Eight hell with semantic stuff. What are you saying now? This thing is like part uh, De Jesus, part six pack, part Bowman. What? I don't know. I'd just be guessing. But I do know this: the Russians deliberately sank that ship to protect themselves. Maybe to protect us all. Okay, so Leviathan, not to be confused, by the way, with its immersive nonfiction namesake put out by Harvard's uh, Sensory Ethnography Lab a few years back, or for that matter, Andreas Vyagensev's feature, which was made even more recently, uh, was released in 1989, produced by Aurelio and Luigi De Laurentiis and Charles and Lawrence Gordon written by David Webb Peoples and Jeb Stewart, distributed by MGM, and it opens 16,000 feet beneath the surface of the Atlantic Ocean on a seabed mining vessel tasked with excavating silver and other precious metals, <clears throat> run by geologist uh, Stephen Beck, played by Peter Weller, who supervises a motley crew consisting of Dr. Thompson, Richard Krenner, Elizabeth Williams, Amanda Pays, Six Pack Parish, played by Daniel Stern, Justin Jones, played by Ernie Hudson, De Jesus Rodero, uh, Michael Carmine, Bridget Bowman, Lisa Eilbacher, and J.P. Cobb, uh, Hector Elizondo. We join them on day 87 of a 90-day uh, shift, where patience is wearing thin, to say the least, uh, understandably so, I think, and then they uh, discover a Soviet shipwreck named Leviathan, from which they take several documents as well as oi oi, a bottle of vodka, <laughs> which of course turns out not to be a v- bottle of vodka, but um, a bottle of water, which of course turns out not to be water exactly, but well, uh, something else, which contaminates six back firstly, then Bowman, and before we know it, there's a transmogrifying creature on board. That's what I got anyway. That's how they get contaminated, right? Yeah, it's not made entirely clear, yeah. but that's what they speculate is happening. Yeah. We never get full confirmation about, uh, about it, but yeah. Yeah. In the Atlantic Ocean, nobody can hear you scream. Do you think the fact that uh, Daniel Stern loots a sunken ship is where he got the idea for for the wet bandits? The wet bandits? <laughs> Yeah, maybe. Although he, he very much becomes a sticky bandit uh, soon after <laughs> infection, <laughs> and m- much more besides. I really like this film. I mean, you know, yeah, I made an al- a reference there to uh, Alien, um, the 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 tagline from the film, which precedes this by ten years. Yeah. I mean, I know you have problems with ov- like overly comparing films to other films and saying it's a rip off or a knock off or whatever else. Um, this no, I don't. I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem qualities. with saying that. I have a problem. I have a problem with the the implication that that in itself is a criticism. 
that this is this right, is clearly a cash in on yeah. Alien and the Thing. Like it's Alien meets right, the Thing yeah. at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, yeah. The thing the thing that annoys me about the commentary on this film uh, is that I've I've lost count of the amount of times that I've read that it's a knockoff of the Abyss, which came out after this. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> it should take you ten seconds to confirm. Yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but like there was no, there were a couple of films uh, the same year. Um, there was also Sean Cunningham, who's best known for directing Friday the Thirteenth and producing Last House on the Left, mm. his film uh, Deep Star Six, which is the same thing. It's the bottom of the ocean. It's a, a you know alien uh, creature or whatever. Uh, and there's also a lesser known film called Lords of the Deep, and these all came out in 1989, which is a weird coincidence. Mm. And what might have happened is that um, the studios might have seen that James Cameron's next film was a you know deep sea. Uh, sci-fi thriller and then quickly looked around and said okay well what what do we have lying around here that uh you know is in that vein yeah and green so, yeah. you know, greenlit and fast tracked a bunch of films that are you know in a kind of similar vein mm. but that is not the same thing mm. as saying that these films are influenced by the abyss because the screenwriters and directors of these films <laughs> couldn't possibly have seen the abyss uh, in you know 1986 when they wrote these screenplays you know yeah um, yeah sure yeah but uh have you seen The Abyss? No, I haven't. No, no, no. I haven't seen it in years. I don't really... Re- but it's not a horror film. Like, these these other ones are horror films. Um, right. Yeah. What's, what's The Abyss? I always understood it to be a horror film. No, it's a sci-fi thriller. Uh, it's about... And it's, I think it's... If my memory serves right, it's it's closer to something like Close Encounters. It's like a... Uh, they, uh, encou- right. they encounter aliens, but they're not, you know, malevolent not ah, monsters, right. Or... I always assumed that they were, um, which might say more about me than it does uh, the film. But um, I might be misremembering, but I don't think it's a horror film. The, the funny thing with the Leviathan is that, you know, we're told at the outset that it's 87 days into a 90-minute shift. I mean, it's, you know, arbitrary figures. It could be, like, you know, 27 <laughs> days into a 30-day shift or whatever. It's kind of meaningless. <laughs> he said, 80, um, 87, he always... said 87 days into a 90-minute shift. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, at the bottom of the ocean, time is compressed, of course. Um, time implodes. Um, it, what I, what always like strikes me as inherently daft, and you know, you have to roll with it in these kinds of films, is the kinds of members that they've put together for this excavation mission, like which is a scientific endeavor, and they're just a bunch of assholes, <laughs> like who are bickering, who are like you know who stretch credulity and everything else with regard to how the hell did these guys get through any kind of educational requirement in order to get onto this vessel. Mm. Um, but that's obviously the joy early on of like, you know, characterization and, you know, who's going to get eaten or infected first or, you know, transformed or whatever. Yeah. Uh, obviously Richard Krenner returns. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> of, I mean, in even more obvious ways, Peter Willard does, but Krenner's like, it's a it's a weird turn by Krenner because he's the doctor who is kind of absent for the first scene, like uh, where a character almost dies because his uh, underwater suit almost implodes. Yeah, uh, because of the pressure problem with the pressure and the doctor on board. Doesn't he say like he'll be playing golf tomorrow or yeah. something like that? He's just like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Like, I'll be, I might be around, I might not be around. It's weird. It's a funny, um, it's a funny piece of characterization because he, there, there is, the, there is, he, they've, they've set up that he's insubordinate and that he has this uh, yeah. checkered past where you know something, uh, some sort of drug that he developed or whatever it was. Anyway, he's he's on this vessel because like he was like this you know prestigious whatever uh, le- yeah. leading. Uh, medical scientist or something like that mm. but uh ultimately it comes to nothing and it, it it's just used later on to justify uh his opinion being disregarded by his superior when he talks about evacuating the uh the research uh um, what's it called <laughs> the research the, base the, or whatever yeah the uh what the, the the mining vessel they're on you mean no i mean what's the correct term for a research uh Hub? Hub? Base? 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 Yeah, base, Whatever. Okay. Yeah. I actually, uh, speaking of, of my memory of the Abyss, I had misremembered the antagonists or the monsters in this as being aliens. Oh, you'd seen this before? Yeah. All oh, right, okay. Um, but I had, I had, I, I thought that it was, 
uh, you know, that, that it was some sort of crashed alien ship that they encountered. Not, right, not right. that it was yeah. uh, it's a, a Russian ship that uh, yeah, they were carrying out scuttled. some sort of... Yeah, they were carrying out some sort of uh, genetic experiments on the sailors on board. Mm. And it got out of hand and they deliberately sunk the ship. Yeah, so early scenes unfold with... Um sort of MacGuffin like conversations about like company stocks, etc, etc. And then like, you know, you've got that classic focus pull to something creature based on the ceiling or elsewhere in the room, a little bit like, um, you know, of unknown origin, where we're aware that something's happening before the characters are because like, they bring like a crab on board, right? Yeah. Um, Like a seabed crab, which is under um, Daniel Stern's pillar six pack um but that's because i thought oh well this is like a creature that's going to grow or something but actually that's a red fly uh, it's a red herring right i don't know if it's some, as much a red herring. i took it to be more of a, a reference to alien because the thing looks so like a face hugger it's yeah, uh, it does, yeah, there's, yeah. Even, there's even a scene where they're they're playing pranks on each other where daniel stern's character puts it inside one of the suits that uh yeah uh, is a bowman who has to inspect yeah, yeah she, she's walking is, along yeah. and she's opening all the the suits and the, this live creature comes out of the suit, and then later on uh, he goes to bed and he lies down in his his uh, his bunk and he has like all these like uh, you know like centerfold pictures stuck to the mm. underside of the bunk above and he, he actually says something like "sit on my face," yeah, and then <laughs> and then he reaches behind the pillow and pulls out the dead creature, uh, yeah, but like there are loads like it's it's, it's so much like it's so consciously. Uh, the thing meets alien. You know, you've got like, you know, the flamethrowers. You've got like the the whole thing about the creature going for the blood supply. It's all from the thing. Mm. You've got a uh, mm. like all the biomorphic imagery. <clears throat> you've got a uh, you know the the um, computer that they talk to. You know, like uh, what do they call the computer in this one? Do you remember? No. Uh, no. No. Mother in Alien. Um, mm. You have all the talk about the company and all that sort of stuff, which is like the that's called tri oceanic in this one. You know, they're expendable yeah. to the company the same way that the the astronauts in uh, or the the space truckers or whatever you want, whatever you want to call them an alien are expendable to the to the company in that film. Yeah, um, the company here is represented by uh, Ms. Martin, played by Meg Foster, mm-hmm. uh, who has very piercingly blue eyes, astonishingly blue eyes, um, who is painted with all kinds of shade and uh borderline malevolence even before it turns out that uh you know they are re- they really are expendable to her and the company mm. um it's a really really funny film this um you know it, it has a laugh and it doesn't take itself too seriously like when <laughs> when it's established that there is some sort of um creature on board right um and jones ernie hudson uh, doesn't creep up onto Jesus, but he inevitably shocks him because he, he's behind him in the room, and De Jesus understandably completely shits himself. <laughs> Ernie Jones is just uh, sorry. Ernie Hudson's like, "Hey man, everybody's jumpy." <laughs> it's like, yeah, you're fucking too right. <laughs> um, but the funniest, one of the funny, one of the funniest moments for me, and we mentioned something earlier with like a Kuleshov effect in another film. Was it Escape to? No, it was a uh, his hand crossing. Just to come back to that, the cool show effect you were talking. Com- you were, weren't you talking about um, the rat in of unknown origin? Yes, perhaps. But uh, I I said we'd come back to it to another um, moment um, in Leviathan. Sorry, long long episode of recording here. So by this point, you know we're all a bit <clears throat> uh, jaded. Thanks for staying with us if you got here so far. But um, <clears throat> uh, it's the moment when. You know, Stern is obviously suffering some kind of... His body's undergoing some kind of change, and uh, he looks like shit, and Krenna, um, you know, sees to him, tends to him. They put his some sort of DNA into the computer, mm. and um, generic alteration or something comes up, and mutation Gen- comes Gen- up on screen. Or Gen- genetic alteration. Genetic, sorry, it's, genetic. But that, that's, that's, but that's a joke later on when they're t- when they're trying to explain what's happening to Miss Martin. Yeah, yeah, and she yeah, says that's generic right, that's alteration. Right. He's like genetic alteration. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like on the screen with the DNA, 
Um, you know, it's it's does that whole like eighties nineties thing where the computer knows everything. Yeah. And then we cut the Stern's face and Krenner's face, like looking at it. And from their reaction, we know that it's bad. But otherwise, the computer screen tells us absolutely nothing. It's oh, so we were funny. we were talking about that in relation to the Cassandra crossing in the in the in yeah. the sense that the midsection of the movie is made up of people waiting That's around right. to get sick and people doing uh, <laughs> yeah. esoteric scientific research that we need to have explained to us. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I I think the there are a couple of really good and I think kind of surprising scenes in the film. That I, I really liked um, Six Pack's resurrection scene. Where uh, Ernie Hudson comes in and he's just talking to him. We we've we we know that Six Pack is dead at that point. So when and, yeah. and Ernie, what, what's Ernie Hudson's character's name? Jones. Jones. Jo- Jones comes in and uh, Jones doesn't know that he he just thinks that he's sick because they haven't told them what's happening yet. And uh, there's a there's a blanket over him, right? Yeah, there's a blanket over him. Uh, we know yeah. that he's dead, but he, then he moves. And that's surprising yeah. to us, but not to Jones, because Jones expects him to move. Yeah, you know, I thought that was really, really good. Uh, and the movement's still like, you know, human, like human enough to be like, yeah, yeah, you know, plausible to to Jones. Yeah. I also, I also thought the the suicide scene when Bowman comes in and sees Six Pack in the middle of his transformation, where he has like the his forearm has like opened up into this weird kind of orifice, and mm. uh, she, the next time we see her, she's cut her wrists in the shower. Because she she sees that that's what's going to happen to her, um, yeah. I thought that was quite good. Mm. Do you think so? Coming to the creature itself, many many episodes ago we covered the Deep Rising, and your one qualm with that film, uh, a film which you otherwise really like, I think, um, mm. is that the the creature is never quite established as to like what kind of creature it is. Yeah. Like it's. It's kind of intricate in some scenes, but then massive, like mother monster, queen queen bee at the end. Um, my my presumption is that you like this creature a little more. You think it's better designed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. No, I actually feel pretty much the same about this one oh, really? as I do about Deep Rising. I find it. Uh... <clears throat> I think I think this I think this film is is weakest in its third act. Uh... Mm. I like I like all the setup. I like the character interactions and and uh, everything up to kind of the the point where you're kind of expecting all of the action beats to kick in. Yeah, and you're expecting yeah. for the um, the creature to become more. Um, you're expecting to see more of the creature, effectively mm. as the film goes on. Uh, mm. And I had, like I said, I had forgotten most of the details of this film. I'd forgotten most of the climax, and it kind of it's it's a pretty by the numbers kind of climax for this kind of film and it plays out with uh no i don't really think there are any like standout moments that stick in memory um yeah and there's there continues to be i think up to a, a too late point this frustrating cutting around the creature a lot of quick cutting where we're only getting little glimpses um yeah. well past the point where another film would have shown you the creature uh and the fact that you, you, the fact that you're not shown the creature, and the fact that there's a real like like in Deep Rising, <clears throat> when in Deep, Deep Rising it's a little bit different because in Deep Rising it's just literally just a question of like the the, the anatomy of the creature. Not to spend another fifteen yeah, minutes yeah. on this, but yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but here it's not as simple as that because this is some sort of um, uh, you know pathogen that's transforming. Uh, yeah, organisms and combining them and, and and creating new things, and we never get sort of a, a sense of what's actually going on. There's like a lack of clarity in the creature concept, yeah. uh, and it yeah. starts to it results in a feeling of a, the the creature being a kind of a random assemblage of of monster beats. Mm-hmm. You know, like oh, here's some mm-hmm. tentacles and here's a like here's some like teeth and here's some like weird biomorphic stuff and. Uh, you know, it's fine, but it's. I don't really think it's any better than that. Yeah, I think of the, my my most lasting memory of the creature as a single sort of visible entity is when I think um, Williams, played by Amanda Pears, is trying to get from one meshed floor to another because it's fallen uh, as they're getting to the escape pods, and we see the creature as some sort of humanoid. In in a humanoid form behind her, very briefly, 
sort of like slowly making its way towards her in a very sort of creature from the Black Lagoon fashion. Yeah. Um, that's that's the most sort of obvious point for me, but I, but I much prefer it when it's got its tentacles and they're getting cut off by like doors and lowering platforms that then cut cut the tentacles off and then the tentacles sort of transform yeah. um, later on. Yeah, I much prefer that kind of stuff than you know a shape of water sort of uh, fish man sort of thing. <laughs> um. One thing that kind of annoyed me, and I, I don't know, like whenever I, I just have a thing about this, like if, if you if you establish uh, your story as taking place, like to, to compare this to the thing or alien, right? Mm. Uh, in the thing, you're set at this Arctic um, station. Was the word I was looking for? Research station. That's what I'm. Okay, so you're the research Arctic... hub, the Arctic research hub, <laughs> the, the hub. <laughs> um, yeah. So you're set at this uh, Antar- Antarctic rather uh, research sta- station. Um, yeah, we we never leave there. Like physically, we're never transplanted from there back to you know yeah. somewhere in the U.S. You know, it's and in in Alien, we we go with the with the uh, the astronauts onto the planet. You know, but we don't. Once we're on the ship with them, we're not cutting away back to somebody at the company. Um, yeah. Here we do the, we do do that. Now I don't mind mm. the fact that they talk to her, but we we there are two points where the the hermetic seal of the film is punctured with the, with kind of pointless shots of like because we already don't trust her. You know yeah, we don't yeah. we don't need That's an what additional. I meant. Like there's that shot of her <laughs> with I think after they've um, you know hung up with the conversation and yeah, then cut to her. That's what I mean. Yeah. Just like the, make a point of her like eyes staring into the middle distance. Yeah, like, like we don't like. She's yeah. not to be trusted, but I mean, she, that's obvious from the second we see her. And, and it's, even, it's obvious before we see her. We're like, we know yeah, the type yeah. of film that we're watching. We know that the, the company is not trustworthy. Uh, yeah. But I always, whenever they do that, you know, another film that does that is uh, Spielberg's Jewel, uh, which I think is a really weird thing where, you know, you're, the whole idea is this kind of, uh, you, should, you should always be with him. You know, it, it should be a very sort of perspectivized kind of story. Uh, and there's a scene where he calls his wife and kids and there's no reason at all for us to see the wife and kids. He's just on the phone. He's talking to his wife. Um, yeah. I can't remember if we can hear her voice over the phone. Or I think we can. And then it cuts to, he goes, oh, you know, bye. And then she's like, bye. And it, it cuts to them at home in the living room. Like, like he had to, they had to cast the wife. They had to cast like three kids. They had to like decorate yeah. the sets all for this shot that does nothing but disrupt the, yeah. the sort of um, sense of location and... Uh, well, do you feel the same way about that with regard to um, of unknown origin? I mean, you know, Shannon Tweed plays Peter Weller's wife, and I mean, we see them before they leave the house, I suppose. But we don't cut from him in the house to them on holiday. Yeah, we do. Do we? Yeah, they're in the swimming pool and uh, everything else. Oh yeah, I suppose. But we, well, no, I don't really feel the way the same way about that because with uh, with that film, it doesn't have the same sort of uh, sense of isolation and and uh yeah. you know that's not kind of not, yeah. not the feeling that they're going for i don't know if it's just if, if i get a sense that there's a hermetic seal around the mm. the film it always bugs me a little bit if it's punctured for no good reason yeah i know what you mean um and coming back to the idea of ret- returning to earth as they do at the very end of this film the final well, the very, the very, very final gag is Peter Weller actually punching Meg Foster in the face. That's um, so funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the the penultimate gag, if you like, I mean, talk about having a bad day or a bad three days. Once they get to the surface of the ocean and they're waiting for the helicopter to pick them up, <laughs> there's fucking sharks. Oh, there's some that's, sharks that's so the funny. Water. I don't know. I don't know whether I was. Rem- I was remembering the film in some weird way but once they got to the surface the thought crossed my mind wouldn't it be hilarious if sharks showed up <laughs> yeah, and, then, and then I was like <laughs> sharks uh, so funny and and his uh, his play on the the Chief Brody uh, smile you son of a bitch line from Jaws is uh, yeah. say ah motherfucker <laughs> as he throws the bomb into his mouth <laughs> I think my single yes. My single favorite image of the film is like is the creature's um, hand, or like is it like the the teeth uh, yeah. stretching out from the palm of uh, is it Krenna's hand? Uh, I can't remember. 
But anyway, somebody, some crew member's hand uh, who's already been infected, and there's like a close up of the palm with like teeth come, like uh, a mouth on it. That's my single favorite image of the film. It's a seven out of ten for me. It's a seven for me as well. Yeah. Okay. Good. On the same page. Should we move on? Yeah. Okay. So finally. Uh, I was able to dig up some information uh, about a project that Cosmatos was attached to um, around 1990-91, um, and it was uh, one of two competing Christopher Columbus biopics that were targeting 1992 release dates to uh, mark the 500th anniversary of Columbus's first voyage to the New World, mm. um, the other one being uh, uh, Ridley Scott's 1492 Conquest of Paradise, which starred uh, Gerard Depardieu in the lead uh the one that cosmatus was attached to uh was called christopher columbus the discovery um and it was to star timothy dalton uh when cosmatus left the project uh dalton also left the project uh john glenn uh oddly dalton's director on his two james bond films came in uh took over as director and christopher reeve took over in the lead uh, and the movie was it, it, uh, <laughs> apparently the uh, the two Columbus films premiered almost at exactly the same time, right? Uh, but Scott's film was much more successful, much more uh, high profile. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, but that's it. And the next uh, film that Cosmatis directed was 1993's Tombstone. You back that queen again, you son of a bitch. I'll blow you right up that wildcat's ass. Do you hear me, huh? Something on your mind? Just want to let you know you're sitting in my chair. <laughs> Is that a fact? Yeah, it's a fact. Well, for a man that don't go healed, you run your mouth kind of reckless, don't you? No need to go healed to get the bulge on a tub like you. Is that a fact? Hmm. That's a fact. Well, I'm real scared. Damn right you're scared. I can see that in your eyes. All right, now go ahead. Go ahead, skin it. Skin that smoke wagon and see what happens. Listen, mister, I'm, I'm getting awful tired of your... <laughs> I'm getting tired of your gas. Now jerk that pistol and go to work. I said, throw down, boy. Oh. You gonna do something or just stand there and bleed? Okay, so Tombstone, uh, produced by James Jax, Sean Daniel, and Bob Misurowski, uh, and written by Kevin Jar, or Jari, I don't know how to pronounce his name. I said Jar um, earlier, so we'll stick with Jar. Okay, we'll go with Jar. Uh, was, um... Produced by uh, Hollywood Pictures, the the uh, Disney subsidiary that used to produce R-rated films, and distributed by Buena Vista Pictures. Uh, there's a, probably an audible banging on my end here, but that's uh, work going on next door. Uh, so apologies for that. It's not our um, your enemies banging on the bunker door. <laughs> to finally, take you away. Um, it was released um, Christmas Eve, nineteen ninety three. Uh, Budget twenty five million, box office fifty six million, um, and was kind of I think kind of overshadowed. Like this would have been released, what like would it would have been the same year that Unforgiven won Best Picture? Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. I think it kind of it, it kind of went under the radar a little bit. Yeah. Anyway, um, so okay, so uh, this was, it was supposed to be Kevin Jar's first job as a director um but he was fired about a month into shooting mm. and george cosmatos was brought on board uh with very little prep time um and it came out later that well it came from kurt russell later that uh kurt russell had actually directed the film and that cosmatos had just been there to sort of oversee things mm. uh and val kilmer has sort of partly corroborated that and said well it was kind of like a collaborative effort between Russell and Cosmatis. Um, I'm always a little bit skeptical of those kinds of stories uh, because you always get tangled up in the semantics of what it actually means to direct a film. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. Like you know, the whole thing about like Steven Spielberg and Toby Hooper 
and Poltergeist. Yeah. And the question of like, well, you know, uh, Steven Spielberg was on set and he was like telling the actors what to do. And it's like, well, that's directing. Yeah. You know, and he was like, set, he was working with the cinematographer to set up the shots. It's like, well, that's directing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and then, then the idea of like, well, Toby Hooper was not involved in post production at all. It's like, well, the director oversees post production as well. But like, that's, that wasn't always true. The director often didn't oversee post production mm. and the producer was the one who oversaw pre and post production. And that would be a creatively involved producer, which you know, would be the case of like, you know, George Lucas in the Star Wars movies, but sure. I don't know. It just, it's always a little bit, uh, you always get tangled up in like, you know, what it actually means. Like what, because, because ostensibly a director is the overarching sort of creative voice from the beginning to the end mm. of all three stages of production. But there's a, there's a more narrow kind of understanding of directing as being setting up shots and directing actors. Sure. I don't know. Whatever. Uh, Anyway, um, so the plot of this one. Uh, former Arizona lawman Wyatt Earp, played by Kurt Russell, moves with his two brothers, Virgil and Morgan, played respectively by Sam Elliott and Bill Paxton, and their wives, to the small but growing mining town of Tombstone to set themselves up in business. Once there, the Earps run afoul of the cowboy gang, led by Curly Bill Brocious and Johnny Ringo, played by Paris Booth and Michael Bean, who, through their reputation for violence and ruthlessness, have run roughshod over the meager law enforcement of the small town. Uh, initially reluctant to get involved in the town's problems, wanting to focus on their entrepreneurial aspirations, Wyatt and his brothers, accompanied by their friend, alcoholic and tubercular gunslinger Doc Holliday, played by Val Kilmer, gradually get drawn into further and more violent confrontations with the cowboys, including a famous shootout at the OK Corral. Uh, I had seen this film before. You hadn't, did you? I hadn't, no. Um, I'd known of it, and I remember it being on television to much acclaim when I was younger. Uh... It's. I mean, you mentioned Unforgiven, um, and the idea that it might have gone under the radar. It was critically well received at the time, I believe. Mm. Um, it has. It's. It's. It. It feels like a much more old-fashioned gunslinging film uh, in ref in in relation to Unforgiven, um, and I and I don't know enough about you know, the critical discourse at the time or how Unforgiven, like, changed things in terms of the Western genre or revised things. Um, so I wouldn't like to commit to anything um, too concrete in that ref in that um, comparison. But I... This, this feels like a, a, a... Almost like a film that's perpetuating rather than exploring or interrogating urban legends surrounding what is a very, very infamous gunfight in American history, um, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Um, it feels more like a film to enjoy rather than be kind of... Although there, there are horrifying things in it, it's a film to enjoy rather than be kind of taken aback by, um, if you know what I mean. Um like yeah, it's I think it's it's the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of its sensibility from something like Unforgiven. Yeah, I mean there's it's, a, there's a it's, Unforgiven is kind of heavy and and uh, you know uh, downbeat. Yeah. Whereas this is much more upbeat and much more uh, yeah, I, it's just like fun. Yeah, I mean there's like a there's an inherent tendency to reinforce a cathartic, satisfying narrative in the Western. I think. It is, after all, um, inherent to American histor historiographies um, and has played a large part in the consolidation of the American image, I think. Uh, and this film doesn't do anything particularly radical to challenge that, I think. Um, although it is, it is a film that I very much enjoyed. Um, and you mentioned fun there. And I also mentioned the fact that horrifying things do happen. Like, you know, the, the opening scene in which we're introduced to the antagonists of the film, they basically, you know, raid a church, uh, a wedding party, and kill everyone, and rape mm -hmm. the bride. Um, yeah. And that, in that opening scene, I mean, not to, not to open with a structural weakness of the film, but in that opening scene, it does sort of hint at, certain tensions within the group of antagonists that come into play much, much later in the film at a point at which we've totally, totally forgotten the fact that Michael yeah. Rooker is involved in uh, Curly Bill's gang. 
Um, yeah. Michael Brooker, who, you know, we've covered um, on the John Singleton episode in, in relation to Rosewood. He's also mm-hmm. come up um, in the Avengers Infinity War episode. I think it's fair to say we're big fans of his. Uh, maybe we should do yeah. a, a journeyman episode di- dedicated to actors or an actor <laughs> and do Michael Rooker. But anyway, Michael Michael Rooker shows up later on on the side of Wyatt Earp and everyone else. Um, yeah, so the es- the escalating <laughs> the escalating series of encounters uh, reaches the point where the cowboy gang uh, breaks into. Uh, I'm not sure which house. Is, I, th- I think it's is it Virgil's house mm. where all the the Earp the Earp brothers' wives yeah. are you know spending the evening together, and just like kicks the door in and like unloads his shotgun into the room, uh, seemingly not with much intention of killing them. It's just like to to terrify yeah. them, um, and that is from the point of view of Michael Rooker and his two uh, colleagues, uh, completely unacceptable and beyond the pale and. Uh, not what he signed up for when he joined the cowboy gang, yeah. and it's just he. It's it's a little bit. It reminded me a little bit of of the wire. When uh, is it Marlowe's gang? I don't know. It's not. Sorry. It's 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 when Stringer Bell and and uh, it's when Stringer Bell is trying to kill Omar, and he orders a hit on him on Sunday yeah. at the church. Yeah. And and Avon is like appalled. Like that's just not. You don't do that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That kind of thing reminded, remind, reminded me of that. Uh, right, I don't want to push... But I agree with you. I agree with you that the this was originally an epic. Mm. Kevin Jarre's script was like... It had loads... There was a sprawling epic all about the, the period and about the, the, the gangs and like the, you know... Mm. Uh, it wasn't just about the Earp family mm. um, the way that it happens to be. So like when, when uh, um, Russell... When when Jar was fired, Russell came on and and uh, whittled the script down just to focus on the Earp family, and then Cosmatos further focused the script the story on the relationship between Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday. Yeah, um, and it's and you can see and like so a lot of the subplots were deleted. So like a lot of the uh, insight that we would have got into the uh, internal sort of yeah um, dynamic of the cowboy gang that's gone. Uh, yeah, and, and there's a sequence at the end where I had forgotten actually how brutal it is. Where um, uh, Wyatt has basically just had enough, and he's not going to like play any games anymore. And he just is going around mur- like murdering people. It's not he's not like apprehending people or whatever. Yeah, he's just yeah. like going around murder- murdering unarmed people. Yeah, uh, and we're, it sort of feels like we're supposed to know who they are. Yeah. When they're being killed, but it's just like a series of guys with with the with the red sashes that represent their membership of the cowboy gang. Yeah. Um. Like there's a guy that he kills while he's like smoking opium or something like that. Yeah. He and goes to put the opium pipe in his mouth, and he, it, it turns out that it's why it's gone, and he just shoots him in the face. But but you're with me when I, I say I, that Ruk, Ruka's sort of twist means very little, or it means yeah, that's a what, lot, that's lot what I mean, less yeah. than it should. Um, Absolutely, and, yeah. It feels it feels like it feels like leftovers from a deleted storyline. And likewise, by the end of the film, is it meant to be finally about friendship? Because there's a final scene between Doc and Wyatt um, that, for me, doesn't quite feel earned emotionally. I mean, it's established that Doc and Wyatt have a friendship that pre-exists the events of the film, and they're surprised yeah. to see Doc in the town of Tombstone uh, when they arrive. Yeah. However. And obviously, like, you know, great, great, great performance by Val Kilmer. Um, wasn't even aware that he was in this film before I started watching it, actually. Um, and, it, you know, that's shame on me because it is a great performance. Um, you know, chemistry's hinted at. You know, I can't say they're not there. But then, like, at the end of the film, when he's dying, when he's on his deathbed, um, Doc, and Wyatt goes to visit him, that scene has a, has a, a, a charge to it by which I, I was presuming, okay, we're meant at this point to feel like this is the culmination of a friendship that has been the driving force of the events of this film that's persisted despite and because of, you know, the action mm-hmm. that we've seen. I didn't get that. No, I agree. And that's what that's kind of what I was suggesting when I said that you started off with a sprawling, yep. you know, like panoramic historical epic yeah. that was pared down to 
be a sort of a more contained Western action film. Yeah. Focusing on the what? Focusing on the Earp family. Yeah. And I think that that's the way it plays out. Like for the first two thirds of the film or so, uh, it plays out as primarily being about the relationship between the three Earp brothers. Yeah. And with Doc as a supporting character. Mm. Uh, and then suddenly Doc is pushed to the foreground and his relationship with Wyatt is, is pushed to the foreground. But I was also thinking of what we were talking about when we, when we talked about Jason and the Argonauts and, uh, we were talking about our familiarity with the, the myths that the story is based on or that the film is based on. Yeah. Uh, and the way in which there's a sort of, there's no canon in the, in the contemporary sense of that word, but there's a, there is a sense of like, this is the story of Jason and the, and the golden fleece. Mm. Uh, but there's a further adventure before that. And, you know, like Hercules shows up in this story. And if you want to read the Hercules stories, there's also myths about Hercules and uh, Medea shows up, but there's a story about what happened after Medea killed Jason and so on. Uh, it kind of reminded me of that. Like it, it, the film at points feels like it would benefit from knowledge of the actual history where like for, on the viewer's part, where yeah. if you actually knew about the history between Doc Holliday and Wyatt Earp in reality, that it would mean more to you and that it's almost like gesturing at that yeah. more so than more so than suggesting that that has been established and developed within the film, that it's kind of gest- gesturing to something outside the film. Well, I, I like what Kazmatos apparently said with regard to the UK Corral, which in cinematic traditions has been the culmination point of the narrative. Here it happens and then there's like another, I don't know how long it is, but there's, there's, a, there's a large chunk of plot narrative to follow. Um, yeah. And I like that. Um, you know, the actual fallout of this um, infamous... Halfway through, isn't it? Yeah, like borderline yeah. legend um, incident. Um, and I, yeah, I agree. So I I get all that, but it also feels like that final scene is perfunctory rather than emotional for me, the, the Wyatt visiting Doc in hospital. Um, however, as I said, I don't want to persist with weaknesses and criticisms of the film because for large chunks of it. Can I just? Can I just? Can I just offer one more though? Yeah, sorry. In relation to that scene, yeah, uh, that what what Doc implores Wyatt to do in that scene is to go and pursue the uh, singer who had That's shown right. up in in town. A, sing, a singer and a and a magician played by Billy Zane uh, show up show up in the town to perform, and Wyatt Earp becomes kind of like fascinated and fixated by this. Uh, this uh, singer, yeah, played by uh, Don Delaney, the, right, and to the to the you know uh, detriment of his relationship with his his uh, wife, who's kind of in the process of descending into a uh, and is it is it opium? Yeah, opium addiction. Yeah, Which is an opium addiction. Okay, um, that is set up thinly developed, and then she just leaves town. Yeah. And then we spend the rest of the film focusing on the conflict with the cowboys. And then at the very end of the film, he returns to her yeah. and they get married. Yeah. But it's, it's again, feels like, you know, the, the leftovers of. Yeah. It, feel, it feels like a rushed wrap up um, that should have been discarded rather than expanded, uh, rather than included. If it wasn't going to be expanded upon, I would love to have seen this Fulham like to execute Jaws script. You know, in, in the way that you've you've described it as it originally was, because um, as I said, for large chunks of it, it is involving, it's absorbing, it has a sweep to it. I love the direction, whether or not it's Cosmatos or Russell responsible for it. But you know, like that, um, like chest height wide screen of like characters descending from carriages and from horses, and like the camera's just positioned ever so slightly beneath shoulder height. So you get this sense of like overbearing masculinities within a, I think a very very well established social milieu. Um, wonderful, wonderful what is your use favorite? of widescreen, like like eight people side by side in some of the compositions. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. really, really amazing. Sorry, what were you going to say? Uh, what is your favorite scene in the film? So there's there's like three standoffs, right? Which I think are extremely well done. The first of which. Um, well, I mean, there's more than three standoffs, but the first three, um, I'll break them down. So there's the first one where Russell, uh, sorry, Earp, first enters the Oriental, uh, the, yeah. the bar that he then... This is my favourite scene. This is the first yeah, one. the one we heard in the clip, uh, but, but describe it anyway. 
Yeah, so yeah. Um, there's a there's like a patron, a regular, let's say, uh, at the gambling table in the bar who's like you know mouthing off, and making a bit of a rush. Played by Billy Bob Thornton. Played by, played by Billy Bob Thornton as Johnny Tyler. Um, and Russell, well, Erp, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Wyatt. <laughs> Director star Russell <laughs> Kurt Russell. Um, <laughs> so he goes over and um, yeah, like half of a fight is psychological anyway, and uh, he just you know runs the guy down without even having to raise his fists, um, which yeah. is really great. Then there's a second. Although scene... he does start slapping him around, which yeah. is really funny. There's a second <laughs> scene in the Oriental um, after after this one where um, Ringo and Doc enter. Uh, no, sorry, Ringo. <laughs> uh, it's been Ringo and Curly Bill. Sorry, uh, enter and there's a standoff between sort of uh, Ringo and Doc Holiday, and Ringo with the um, reputation for being the fastest gun in the land, but then Doc Holiday is also known for his speed, and uh, mm. he just the withering the withering response that Doc, who's obviously intoxicated gives Ringo. So Ringo's doing all this like gunslinging show off thing and everyone's like applauding and then uh Doc just responds by doing exactly the same but with his uh cup of alcohol as if it's a gun. Yeah. <laughs> which I really, really loved. I think I prefer that one um to the first one. And then there's the third one, uh which is just outside where after Curly Bill kills Fred White, the sheriff, and um mm. Herb kind of goes out, apprehends Curly Bill and is confronted by the rest of the cowboys, and then the other ribs come, and then Doc's there, and it all, it's yeah. all a bit tense. There's an actual like standoff. Um, those, I think those three scenes are the standout scenes before any of the you know, events leading to OK Corral. Um, I think they're you know, highly, highly enjoyable. That is, that is a great scene where he, uh, he the, con- the confrontation is with Ike, mm. the guy who has. You know, already had a conf- confrontation with uh, Doc in the in the Oriental, but yeah, uh, why puts a gun to his forehead and says, "You know, you die first, Ike." And somebody else says, uh, "He's bluffing," and Ike's like, "No, no, he's not. No, he's not." <laughs> yeah, played by Stephen Lang in a very, very different role to what he will, the, what we'll talk about in the next segment. But um, yes. Oh wow! I didn't recognize him. Yeah, he's he is he is kind of unrecognizably uh, animated. Here I, 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 I had isn't. trouble. I had trouble <laughs> even recognizing him in in the Shadow Conspiracy. I even had trouble recognizing him because I know Stephen Lang primarily from Don't Breathe, which is you know just two years ago. So he's way younger in these films, right? Right. Yeah. Sure. Uh, and obviously Avatar as well. Yeah. But uh, yeah. But the, those those scenes are great. Um, I was I was gonna say. Um, this film has a sort of clean, manufactured, even studio feel to it that I might otherwise not respond to positively. But there's a there's like a crispness. I mean, this is also to compound that. As I was watching, I'm thinking at times this is almost suspiciously beautiful to look at, in a way that none of Cosmatos' other films are. I mean, like Cobra. Yeah, we've mentioned like Cobra has a really nice steely palette to it. This though, I mean, some of the vistas in this, and the the sweeping feel to it, I find myself wanting, like, instinctively to resist it because I'm like, this film shouldn't be as beautiful as it is in some ways. Do you know what I mean? Uh, why why shouldn't that be beautiful? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> That's what I mean. It's just like an instinctive thing that kicks into me. It's, it's like I shouldn't be caught up in this. But westerns are often I beautiful. Yeah, I know exactly. Of, like John uh, Ford's. I know. John Ford's westerns are famous. Maybe for it's the wall to wall score that accompanies the action as well. That uh, that actually we haven't mentioned in relation to mm. Cosmatos' filmography as a whole, but he's a as a whole, but he's a director that utilizes music uh, often. Let's say to put it lightly and to put it yeah. diplomatically, um, and adds, as I say, to the studio feel of this film. But I think the the production design, everything, the cinematography is absolutely gorgeous. Um, yeah, it's a great looking film. Watching it on uh, VLC, I found myself pressing Shift and S uh, to screen grab almost every image. <laughs> um, can I say one thing about that scene that we were just talking about outside the Oriental yeah. where uh, the the um, sheriff um, 
Fred White. Fred White, the Mar- Marshal. Sorry, the Marshal. Marshal Fred yeah. White. Yeah, sorry, not 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 Johnny B and the Sheriff. So when Marshal Fred White is killed by uh, Curly Bill, yeah, um, th- it happened. The way that it happens is cr- he Curly Bill is drunk and he's just like out in the street shooting at nothing in particular. Yeah. Uh, and the Marshal comes out and demands that that uh, Bill hand over his guns, and Bill says, "Oh, I'm just." I think he says, "I'm I'm only funning," and he hands hands over the guns. <sighs> Uh, handle first, yeah. But the way that he hands them, the gun discharges and and shoots the marshal. Yeah. Uh, and I I thought I, I and and then when when the marshal is shot, Bill says marshal and like runs over and it's like it's an accident, yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, but then it doesn't play out like that. But in in reality, it was an accident, and the reason that he wasn't charged was that before the marshal died, he said to other people it was an accident, right? Yeah. So I wonder, what, did that play out in the script? Because I don't see the point in dramatizing it as an accident if you're in the moment if you're not going to follow through on the implications of that. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's. He may as well just, just shoot to him, come at it you know? from an yeah, yeah, to come at it from another angle. Uh, the, you know, the herbs are painted at moments at points. I mean, you've already mentioned that sequence, the montage uh, towards the end where he's just like killing indiscriminately. They're painted potentially as bad or in uh, in as bad a light as the cowboys are um but there's then moments where you're right i think like where they've kind of skirted over some issues in order to reposition the film's moral compass uh mm-hmm. and i think it's ultimately to the film's detriment i don't think it's a fatal flaw i mean it's still highly enjoyable despite these issues um but yeah i think and and booth gives such a great performance as the guy who's the villain, but also like, you know, the Cowboys have a, and I think also Michael Biehn's great as well as Johnny Ringo. Um, You know, they're kind of pathetic and fallible in the same way that the Earps ultimately are in a way. Um, But you know, that's, that's, that doesn't really play out. I agree. Yeah, I think in a way you could say the film sort of falls between two uh, poles where, you know, it could have been this sweeping panoramic historical epic uh, fully articulating all of its storylines and relationships uh, and character arcs. Or on the other hand, it could have been even more pared down. Yeah. And they could have, they could have jettisoned even more of the material that, that, that sits in here in a kind of vestigial form. Yeah. And focused like just kept the focus on this conflict and, and made the kind of like you know rootin' tootin' gunslinging yeah uh you know f- fun western adventure film that action adventure film that uh they appear to have settled on and decided to make yeah but maybe it's too long maybe it it's it, it's there's a little bit of uh you know uh residual Baggage. I mean, it's that, uh, that should have been trimmed further. I know that the, it was a troubled production, and they had a, they didn't have a lot of time. Yeah, there was a lot. It was one of those. It was one of those productions where they were doing the day's shooting, and then they were storyboarding for the next day that night. Yeah, you know, it's un- that kind of I thing. I mean, it's unbelievable. That, you know, the money involved in these kinds of productions. How that? How these things even happen? Yeah, you know, it's 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 like the way we prepare for the habitus. Yeah. Yeah, well, we storyboard the habitus. Um, no, you're right. I mean, it's it's either way too long or way too short, and it reminds me a little bit of what Mike D'Angelo um, says of Heat, which is you know a top five film for me. But um, you know, he says, and it's doesn't quite make your four favorites. It does. It's no. It's 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 a my oh, letterbox four. Yeah, okay. but uh, my letterbox. <laughs> I I don't agree with having a top four. You know, that letterbox. It's cruel that letterbox doesn't have a top five. So, so I have to keep I have to keep <laughs> rotating them. So I know I know that recently you noticed that the French Connection had been ditched from my top four with a shock face. French Connection remains my number one <laughs> film, but on the, for the purposes of a democratic top four on Letterboxd, I have to keep rotating them. Um, just just let everyone know. But um, no, the, the, what he says about Heat um, is that it's it uh, that could be a long running series or you know a, an epic that's actually longer than three hours. And really flesh out some of its subplots and relationships, or it could be sure. really, really pared down to just the De Niro Pacino thing. So I think this film kind of suffers from the same things, albeit its flaws are imposed rather than the outcome of um, actual choices. 
or directorial choices. I have one last thing to say, and it also relates to Michael Rooker. Uh, what is going on? Maybe it's another uh, you know, consequence of the script changes, but what is going on when he goes after he's defected from the Cowboys and he just goes and meets with them in this like isolated yeah. location? What does he think is going to yeah. happen after he's been killing their gang members? Yeah, perhaps there's a the, perhaps there was a well, scene like it's, that it's, explained that, but uh, yeah, it's yeah, it comes as no surprise. It, just, it, it feels like he, when, yeah, uh, no, it feels like he should know <laughs> that he's going to his death, yeah. like for sure. <laughs> You know, you mentioned um, um, Stephen Lang is unrecognisable. Thomas Hayden Church, for me, as his brother, Billy Clanton, is unrecognisably young here. Because I only know, like, Thomas Hayden yeah, Church yeah. from, like, Sideways. That was my first encounter with him. And they're like... Sideways and Spider-Man yeah, 3. Yeah, exactly. Me. And, like, he shows up in this, and I'm like, oh, who's that again? I should. I feel like I should know that face. And then, yeah. Anyway, it's a, it's okay. a, it's a uh, 7 out of 10 for me. It's a 7 out of 10 for me as well. I, I, uh, I think there are there are parts of it that are fantastic and other parts of it that are that feel a bit kind of long-winded or a little bit yeah. kind of under articulated and yeah chunks uh, of it but yes it's a film, a film that i do like chunks of it are innate and it would be an overall it if there was more of donna delanian <laughs> okay let's move on uh okay so i couldn't find anything between uh tombstone and uh, his final film either so let's move straight on to 1997's shadow conspiracy Your sources. Bobby, what just happened? Was it Pachenko? I'm not telling you my sources until you tell me what just Pachinko happened. Pachenko is dead. The same guy that just tried to kill us shot him in the head. He died in my fucking arms last night. Jesus. Pachenko tried to tell me some wild story about a traitor in the government. He started to say something. Something about Shadow. You gotta talk to me, Amanda. Yeah, it was Pachenko and his study group. They have this database that correlates everything that our public officials do. If there's any evidence of bribery or misuse of government funds or interagency misconduct, stuff like that, then this program will find it. And they call it Shadow? I don't know. Okay, so tell me, what, what is Shadow Conspiracy about? <laughs> right, so produced by Andrew G. Viner, uh, Buzz Feitrans, and Terry Collis for Synergy Pictures, and again, Hollywood Pictures, written by A.D. Hassack and Rick Gibbs. <laughs> That's not a reflection of your opinion of the film, I hope. <laughs> um, <laughs> it centers on uh, Bobby Bishop, uh, played by Charlie Sheen, a special aide to the U.S. president, played by Sam Waterston, whose old professor has uncovered a conspiracy within the U.S. government <gasps> to overthrow the president prior to a re-election campaign. Uh, he, Bobby's helped in his cause by old flame and journalist Amanda Givens, played by Linda Hamilton. And I suppose all you need to know about the conspiracy itself is that among the president's staff is a vice president played by Ben Gazzara, and get this, a chief of staff played by Donald Sutherland. <laughs> uh, now, Shadow Conspiracy yeah. was made for $45 million, and upon its release on the final day of January in 1997, it made $2 million. And I'm, I, I find it difficult to say that without almost bursting into laughter. Is that, it also, is that, its, is that its first day gross or its first weekend gross? No, no, no. That's, this, that's its box office takings. Altogether? Yes. Its domestic box office is $2 million. It has, a zero, <laughs> it, has, it has a zero. It has a zero percent score on Rotten Tomatoes. If that means anything as well, like I don't know how, how, like how frequently that happens on Rotten Tomatoes. As somebody who never well, for it. films that for films that are like Rotten Tomatoes was launched in I think ninety eight. So for right. films prior to that, they haven't sourced that many. So they uh, never reviews. okay. So they don't like reaggregate and stuff like because I'm presuming like critics have written about Shadow Conspiracy since then. That might like. Yeah, start, I guess I don't know. You know. I don't know if they do that. I'm not sure. But anyway, at any rate, um, do you do you think, you know, let's let's open it up straight away. Do you think it deserves such a harsh, cruel fate? I'm really surprised that it only made two million dollars. <laughs> that's that's pretty poor. <laughs> because because the thing that struck me about this was like the first thing. First of all, let me say that I. Well, well, we'll get to ranking Cosmatis' films when we finish this segment, but yeah. uh, 
the the first thing that occurred to me here watching this one was man remember when charlie sheen was an actual leading man like it was a real period in the 90s when he was in films like this and uh you know the arrival and uh terminal velocity and like all these like you know yeah. like none of which i've seen by the way right uh i think i think charlie sheen is an absolutely terrible actor uh, really? I think he, yeah, I think he, the, the films that I know him best from are the Hot Shots movies. Yeah, that's the only um, films I think I've seen him in. But, uh, and, and and shortly after this, he basically transitioned into being like a sitcom actor on like Two and a Half Men and the other the other sitcoms that he's done. Yeah. Um, which, you know, I've, I've obviously seen because it's been running for like 15 years, but mm. uh, he, 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 he constantly seems to have one eyebrow raised. It's like he's. It's like the the his his the register in which his performance is given is just continued from Hot Shots. It's like he's in a different film, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. and and almost all of his uh, his lines are delivered in the same uh, tone and convey almost no emotion at all. So like whether he's supposed to be expressing fear or surprise yeah. or concern or urgency yeah. or panic, uh, it's all just the same. It's an incredibly flat, <laughs> flatline performance. Yeah. Um, also, this is kind of the, this was the same year as Dante's Peak, which mm. so it, this and Dante's Peak are kind of the last major films that Linda Hamilton was a lead in as well. Mm. Um, before she transitioned into a lot of her stuff, started going straight to video. Um, yeah. And and and, and she, she did like telefilms and stuff like that. Well, I mean, with a fucking box office gross of two million, though, I mean, what can you do? <laughs> yeah. Jesus Christ! Didn't do Fuck. anybody any favors. It's also because last one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oof, <laughs> this mean, is the career geez. killer. Absolutely brutal. Uh, I mean, like, but what, I... but what you what you mentioned? Sorry, what you mentioned there about uh, all you need to know is that uh, Ben Gazzara and Donald Sutherland are in it. <laughs> yeah. uh, one one of the top rated reviews on Letterbox is uh, I think the user's name is Dirk H. Uh, it just says, "Look at that cast." And guess who the bad guy is? This film takes <laughs> this film takes a hundred minutes to get there, and like literally the second Donald Sutherland is introduced, I was like, he's the baddie, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it's weird, right? Because um, you know Sutherland is, I mean, Kazara as well is absolutely great, but Sutherland, before you even begin to watch this film, you look at the cast, and Sutherland's like uh, uh, operating across his career and in terms of natural talent on another level to the rest mm-hmm. of the cast here, I think, right? Yeah, and absolutely. weirdly, it wasn't it wasn't Charlie Sheen who I thought was miscast. It was Donald Sutherland because he's distractingly talented, right? In a way <laughs> and um and yet and yet seems to have cottoned on to the fact before everyone else did that he was in a fucking turkey. And is giving a kind of half committed performance, I think, in this. I think he's coasting along in a role yeah. that he can do with his blindfolded and with his hands tied behind his back. Um... <laughs> he's also he, the the dialogue in the film is is usually pretty bad, except for his dialogue yeah. to the extent that it almost seems like he wrote it himself or he improvised <laughs> it or something. <laughs> yeah. a, the, the the other the other person who's well. I mean, I think Charlie Sheen is terrible, and because he's the leading man, you know that that hurts the film more than anything else. Yeah. Uh, but also Nicholas Tortoro as uh, Grasso, Mister Gra- Grasso, the yeah. uh, like every one of these movies needs some sort of like tech genius. Yeah. He's the worst I've ever seen. Mm. <laughs> he's just unbelievably bad. It's it's a, such a weird uh, bit of casting. Um, yeah. Absolutely bizarre. Uh, but there's an interaction between him and Donald Sutherland where he, I can't remember, what is the metaphor that he uses? The tr- something, a death train uh, causing uh, death at every station or something like that. And, Maybe and, he was uh, referring Donald to the Sutherland says, da- Donald Sutherland says, uh, keep your brilliant metaphors to yourself. And uh, he also uses the word negatory. He's like, a negatory is not a word. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and he also, when he, when he first shows up, he says something about, uh, doesn't he remind you of Jimmy Cagney? It's almost like Donald Sullivan is commenting on the bizarre casting of this this actor in this role. Um, when, like, you know, like the following year we had Enemy of the State where, like, that character is played by Seth Green. And it's like, yeah. that's the kind of character that, that's the kind of actor you put in that role. Yeah. <laughs> Nicholas yeah. Tortoro is a strange choice. Uh, but yeah, I know I agree that Donald Sullivan is good. He's always good in these types of roles. But, like, I, I presume you also just 
twigged immediately that he was the bad guy. Yeah, I mean, I mean, like, uh, so you know, in the in the very few notes, once, once they once they establish that he's friends with with Charlie Sheen, that's it. That's that's enough. You know, <laughs> you know what's coming. But it can well, go nowhere else. But what I'm saying about Sutherland is that on paper he's by far and away the best actor in this. But I don't yeah. think his performance is particularly better than anybody else's. Um, as I said, it's almost as if he cottoned on to the fact that this is isn't a very good film and really couldn't be bothered with it. Because I think he's he's he doesn't he gives us nothing in terms of is he or isn't he the villain? Is he or isn't he going to be the villain? Like he's like no, it's, yeah, he's it's, like it's, visibly it's, suspicious yeah. even before like the script hints that he's the villain. He's like just the way like it's almost as if he's he's <laughs> a fucking he took it upon himself to be a walking spoiler through his own film. Like oi oi, there's I'm, a scene, I'm where, he, be there's the a scene where he falls asleep. <laughs> there's, there's even a scene where he falls asleep in the middle of the. Uh... It's like he's taking the piss out of the movie. Yeah, it is. It's, it uh, it completely it's, is. Honestly. But that's 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 why that's why it's the best thing in it. And though. by all accounts, uh, I I think that Donald Sutherland is very capable of that kind of reflexive, conscious performance. Uh, I think he he could, if he wanted to, very much torpedo a production in that sense on screen and otherwise. Yeah. Um, you know, not to not to. Risk libel or anything like that, but uh... like there's there's a scene there's a scene where the scene that I'm referring to, uh, Charlie Sheen and Linda Hamilton have broken into the wherever yeah. it is, and uh, <laughs> they've they've hacked into or no they haven't hacked into but they've they've figured they've they've used uh, Donald Sutherland's character's password to get yeah. into his private database yeah. to get whatever the information is, and uh, Nicholas Tortoro's character is monitoring all the computer systems in the building, and he sees that. Uh, Donald Sutherland's character. Donald Sutherland's character has uh, has logged in, and he turns around, and Donald Sutherland is like asleep on the table, and uh, he's like, "Did you log into the database?" He wakes him up. And he's like, "Well, I'm here with you. Obviously, I didn't log in." <laughs> it's like he's become so bored by the film that he's just checked out. Yeah, Sutherland had um, kind of a a formative. He was a formative presence in my early cinephile days, because he plays Warden Drumgool, who I'm sure I've mentioned before, uh, in Lockup. He's, the, he's Sylvester Stallone's antagonist in that film. Another great John Flynn film. I'm sure I've mentioned it before. We should do a John you, Flynn you episode. You have mentioned John Flynn yeah, yeah. before. Lockup was my first favourite film, I think, yeah. uh, before I before I upgraded to the likes of The Samurai and everything when I went through my pretentious phase. But coming back to Sutherland... <laughs> Um, and that scene you've just mentioned when they break, when they hack into his computer, doesn't his computer on screen also say like he ordered the killing of somebody with extreme prejudice? Like it's the first <laughs> fucking shut up conspiracy ever. <laughs> uh, the funniest, or I don't know if it's I, like who knows. Let's not speculate about the uh, intentions, but um, the the scene where uh, they're trying to locate. Uh, Linda Hamilton's car mm. and it's like top priority we need to find uh, this car Yeah, and he orders Nicholas Tortoro to you know do whatever he needs we need to we need to get, get some satellite images and he yeah. says satellite images to find a car you know what I'm going to have to do I'm going to have to you know reroute satellites that are watching Cuba maybe take some <laughs> from the Middle East and where is she in her apartment <laughs> Like they could have just had someone watching her apartment. Like, why yeah. don't they have someone watching yeah, her apartment? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like they take satellites from all over the world <laughs> trying to find this car. It's like, oh, she's in the most obvious place she could possibly be. Um, you mentioned Stephen Lang. Uh, okay, so yes. like, I, I didn't, I didn't like, I didn't like this film. Uh, I found it kind of, it's a very boilerplate political conspiracy thriller yeah. with a terrible lead. Uh, so for me, like the the plots in these movies are never interesting. Mm. Um, so that's not what you're here for. You're here for much like in a Hitchcock film, something like uh, you know, like Saboteur or something like that, where you don't really care about the uh, yeah, or like North by Northwest or something like that. It's not about the the plot really. It's the plot is just a mechanism for moving from one sequence to the next, yeah. and hope hopefully the character that you're moving with is engaging and charismatic. And uh, mm. 
hopefully the sequences that you're moving to and from are exciting, you know, suspenseful, action-packed, thrilling, mm. humorous, uh, stylish. Very little of that here. There are the, the the merits that the film does have. I think all all in, include Stephen Lang's uh, like almost Terminator esque uh, hitman. Yeah, he's very T one thousand in this. Yeah, he is the 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 chase, the foot chase through the like shopping center. Yeah, uh, is it a shopping center? And he, uh, you know, ends up with with Charlie Sheen hanging outside the window on the yeah. window washer platform thing, um, and ends up in in a very kind of fugitive style being like kind of flushed down the, I don't know what's going on to be honest with you in terms of the, the, the architecture of that building or what, <laughs> where yeah. they are, or what's happening, but uh, he ends up in, what is that supposed to be the sewer or? Uh, yeah. I guess. Uh... <laughs> Whatever. Whatever. Um, that's probably the best scene in the movie. Would mm. you say that's the best sequence? Yeah. You, uh, there's not much in the way of suspense sequences. Like they, when they break the, in and they're hacking into the thing, there's a little bit of. There's the elevator sequence. Yeah, where the guy is the on a motorbike shaft. in the elevator. Um, no, no, no. Like, so the where Linda Hamilton and Charlie Sheen are like outside of the actual elevator in the shaft and have to sort of negotiate their way around. Um, oh, yeah. Because yeah, Madison yeah, yeah, is okay. that, it has that old fashioned 90s action feel where we see, like, so if there's any sort of impact or collision, because Matos edits it very fast, but we see this collision like two or three times uh, yeah, yeah. from different angles, which I always quite, I always find quite charming. Doesn't really happen that much nowadays, um, but like a kind of the action equivalent of like creative geography. Um, Roger Ebert, who gave it one star, you've mentioned that Sue like space that doesn't really, we're not really sure what it does. Um, Ebert ref- references a steam and sparks factory, which actually recalls the climax of Cobra. Um, and he yeah. said, and he says, so named because all it apparently produces are steam and sparks. <laughs> um, and it's true. <laughs> it's like one of those kind of nondescript uh, backdrops that so many of these kinds of films seem to take place in. Um, but mm. you're right. You mentioned like Hitchcock and it's very much, I think, trying to operate in that vein. You know, you've got, not a wrong man thriller, but a certain uh, somebody who is targeted by the very people who they're trying to expose, um, dragged back into a romantic uh, thread with a former flame who was also of use to him as a journalist. Um, And then, you know, the practical difficulties of living on a day-to-day basis uh, in that context such as like you know the twin room in the hotel etc etc but like we don't really feel any sort of romantic connection between sheen and hamilton no. right there's it's kind they of have, they have no chemistry at yeah, all it's kind of dead but you, how could you have chemistry with charlie sheen though oh, i know it's true it's uh what? i mean so, this so is... you're, you're saying that you only know charlie sheen from hot shots yeah 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 i like in cinematic yeah. terms i can't remember anything right. that i've seen him in uh oh yeah um, he's, a, he's in platoon right Oh sure, Platoon and Wall Street. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I haven't seen I, Wall like, Street. I, I haven't seen Platoon in a long time, but yeah. I, I remember thinking he wasn't good in Wall Street either. Yeah. Uh, I like Emilio Estevez though. I was thinking about that. Like, mm. I really, I think Emilio Estevez like got all the charisma. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um. Anyway, who, uh, who, who he's like Charlie Sheen plays like a parody Martin Sheen, you know, like a spoof of his father. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know what you mean. Um. <laughs> but Lang disappears for the majority of the midsection or the late midsection of the film. Yeah. He's just gone. Yeah. And like when when uh when we get the scene in the subway, we have uh somebody else chasing uh who is that? What the guy on the motorbike? Yeah, the guy on the motorbike. Yeah. Isn't it? It's not Lang. No, it's not. Jesus, I don't know. Uh, when did you watch this? Lang. How long ago? <laughs> <laughs> A few hours ago. Jesus. I mean, it's um, know, a little bit longer than that. No, I can't. I, see, that's the thing. I don't. I don't think that the character. It's definitely not Lang. No. The character that uh, chases him on the motorbike and that gets into the elevator and comes down the elevator yeah, on yeah. his little uh, his, his motorbike. Because um, at that at that at that time, where we or shortly after that, we get we get cutaways to what Lang is doing, and he's building this like what looks like a toy robot that like a remote controlled robot that yeah. can you know 
uh, shoot bullets. Roger Ebert um, also picks up on that, saying that um, he needs some sort of physics graduate to explain to him how a toy helicopter can withstand the, is it the backfire or whatever, that the machine, the actual machine gun would cause. How is it not derailed? Kickback, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the kickback, sorry, yeah. Um, yeah, cause, but that's, that, that was a little bit disappointing because even though that's also like one of the better scenes in the film when he tries to kill the president with a remote control helicopter yeah. um, fitted with uh, actual some sort of actual, like not, not like a light <laughs> firearm, yeah, like some sort of like machine gun. Uh, <laughs> But, but I, like what he's using when he's when he's building these things in his house is some kind of robot or something. Mm. I was really hoping that the present that he brings, it's like the, what is going on? And like, is that like is it meant to be the president's birthday and everybody's yeah, bringing yeah. in like boxes of giant? And they don't even inspect what's in the box. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> they yeah. pat him down, but they let him bring in this big box. Uh, anyway, I was hoping that when the box opened, it would be like a remote control like robot. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been better. Um, nah, yeah, no, I, I think it's just a very kind of boilerplate uh, conspiracy thriller, which is not really a genre that I would be that into. You know, like it would have to be done in the in the Hitchcockian yeah. style, where the plot really doesn't matter, and it's all about style and set pieces, right. and uh, effectively mines the scenario for tension and and thrills and suspense. Yeah, uh, has a crucially has a charismatic lead because you're with that character for the whole thing yeah and you really can't do any worse than charlie sheen um in that respect you know i it's it's made me possibly counterintuitively from your angle but uh it's made me want to actually watch the film again immediately with 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 that in mind because when i was watching i must admit like I wasn't enthralled by Sheen, but nor was I like thinking, God, he is such a fatally, uh, <laughs> you know, um, uncharismatic presence in this film. But I, 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 I agree, you know, not wowed by him. I, I suppose I would be naturally more drawn to this kind of film than you would be. It's very post Tom Clancy. Uh, I mean, it comes after the Harrison Ford and Alec Baldwin incarnations of Jack Ryan, Clancy's a uh, recurrent protagonist yeah. in Hunt for Red October, Patriot Games, um, Clear and Present Danger. And uh, actually Sheen kind of fits the Jack Ryan bill almost um, as, you know, a kind of every man who's a good man to have him a good man to have in a storm, not necessarily an action lead, but somebody who's quick thinking and able to kind of, you know, negotiate and navigate the many different bureaucratic obstacles, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, of the government. Um, but I agree. I mean, he, he he's not he's not great in the role. By the way, I I always preferred Alec Baldwin in that role than Harrison Ford, um, because Harrison Ford was at, at that point was more of an action man. I think Alec I think Alec Baldwin and Harrison Ford obviously they're in a different league in a different league altogether from Charlie Sheen in terms of their acting uh, abilities but uh they both particularly Harrison Ford can play an everyman. I don't yeah, think yeah, Charlie Sheen right. can play an everyman. No. I, I but think if he can't uh, play an everyman like, what can he play? Like when 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 uh he can play a spoof character in a Hot Shots film. <laughs> uh yeah. and he can play himself in long running and terrible mm. sitcoms. Um, but the, the the parts where the film develops some kind of pulse are are, are the action set pieces, yeah. and those are the scenes in which you know Charlie Sheen, I'm presuming, is like at least partly replaced by a stuntman, uh, you know, and he's like not he's not really acting, yeah, you know, he's just like doing physical things, yeah. Um, but any of the scenes, like particularly the scenes near the beginning, because the film does pick up as it goes on relative to how it starts, because at the start when you're just getting these scenes like where it's supposed to be like the father, the, the kind of surrogate father son relationship between Sutherland and Sheen. And then the kind of the, the non-existent like romantic uh, tension between Hamilton and Sheen yeah. at the party where he's like and he's even dressed in like it's he's in in the suit and it's like it's like you're watching Hot Shots but it's not funny. Uh, That's what I was gonna say. Um, this film, in some ways, plays out almost like a parody of the genre it's purporting to to contribute to. Yeah. However, it yeah. doesn't do it with any kind of reflexive. Uh, nods to the audience or wink wink nudges and I have to say it's very self except arguably from Donald Sutherland yeah 
who, Maybe. who definitely wasn't directed <laughs> to play the role in that way, though. I don't think. You know, honestly, yeah, no, it's such a fucking probably not. torpedo job from him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, like, e- even, like, you know, there's, there's comic potential there, though, in the impossibly cool, as we said, Terminator-like performance from Stephen Lang. But we're meant to take him, like, his character kind of, like, literally. And, like, we can't anymore, you know? And it might be no. very post-97 perspective from which we're viewing the film. But, he, you know, even at the time, it didn't ca- catch on because it... <laughs> so made two million, million dollars. Million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what its worldwide gross is? No, no, I don't know. That's um, domestic. I can't. I can't imagine. You know, over twenty years ago, that it would have been much better than that. No, um, huge in China. And yet, uh, and yet, do you know what I've seen was sorry. And yet, and yet, I was just going to say everything you said. Nothing you said I disagree with, but I didn't mind the film. I have to say, I find it an enjoyable watch, and maybe it's that just having what what that you know. That kind of thing where you just have to kind of roll with it, I think. Sure. Have you seen Enemy of the State? The yeah, yeah. Song? yeah, which I very much like. Yeah, I mean, like compare compare the like Will Smith as one of the <laughs> most charismatic screen presences Absolutely. of all time yeah. to Charlie Sheen, and you know, like you've got John Voight in that. Yeah, you Gene know. Hackman. But the thing, the thing, the, and Gene Hackman, obviously, yeah, of course, and the you know the. Uh, the tech guy, as I mentioned earlier, is Seth Green. Yeah, yeah. Is like proper, properly well cast. There's also no mystery really in that. Like we know, John Voight is the bad guy right yeah, from the beginning. It's just a thriller. Yeah. Anyway, we're gonna we're gonna cover we're gonna do our Tony Scott uh, journeyman episode, and we'll cover Enemy of the State, which I'm a huge fan of. Mm. Um, so I am I like I do respond to these kinds of films when they're done well. Uh, you know, when you've got charismatic characters, you've got like stylish direction. Yeah. You've got uh, you know, thrilling action you've got well-written dialogue you know it's not here at all it's just it's just it's just not it just doesn't work do you know what scene is really really funny and i like cracked up at was the scene where uh the three conspirators meet on the pier uh, (laughs) Uh, and uh linda hamilton is is (laughs) linda hamilton is taking photographs while charlie sheen in another location uh, operates a little uh, miniature um, tape recorder, yeah, and he's recording the conversation. And then, for reasons that are not clear to us, he decides to kind of move a little bit closer and reach his arm around over yeah. the boat. And then, what does he do? He fucking presses like the eject- the tape falls out of the recorder into the water. It's like plop, <laughs> and then Donald <laughs> Sutherland says, "What was that?" <laughs> That's so, it's so daft. As if, you know, as if that okay. extra few inches <laughs> of the arm extended is going to, like, pick up the recording anymore. Amazing, yeah. honestly. But how does the tape fall out? Does he, does he press, <laughs> he press the eject <laughs> That's so silly. Um, also, I, actually, one last thing is, uh, cause you mentioned in, in regards to Tombstone that everything looks kind of very, kind of like, like a set and looks looks very kind of immaculate yeah. and everything. Yeah. There was a there was a feeling that I was getting early on in this movie that the street that they're shooting on, yeah, uh, where Linda Hamilton's apartment is located and where there's like a shootout earlier on, uh, that it looked really fake. It looked like a studio street. Yeah. Um, which obviously, like, it is, you know, but yeah. It, 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 there was something about it that, like, I, and I was trying to figure out why. And I, my first thought was, is it the sound design? Mm. Is there something about the sound design that's like cluing me into that this is not real? Because I was looking for like something in the in the image that was a sure. giveaway or something, and I couldn't find anything. And but then later on, they're using the same thing and they're using the same sets, and uh, it didn't feel that way. And I was thinking maybe it's like the lenses that they're using early on or something like that. Maybe they're using longer lenses or right. I was I, I couldn't pinpoint exactly what it was about it, but there was a sense of like, like uh, almost like hilarious artificiality to the mm. street scenes early on mm. uh, that I didn't I didn't pick up on. It's later. not like the because um, you mentioned the lenses. It's, it's not also those combined with like the third man style canting camera angles, is it? Which lends everything a kind of hokey studio bound feel. 
I don't know. I couldn't. I couldn't pinpoint exactly what it was, but there was. You know what? Fuck it. Uh, I, I, I only rented it. Maybe I'll go back and compare them. Off Amazon Prime, but I'm gonna re-rent it. I'm gonna watch it again. With every, I, I feel like it can only benefit from <laughs> okay. uh, a rewatch with with everything that we've said in mind. But uh, it's a seven out of ten for me. Somehow, it's still seven. I liked wow. it. Yeah. Maybe maybe it it's should a four for me. Maybe it should be a six, but I'm gonna stick to my guns here because. On every other occasion, I allow you to whittle my score down. <laughs> gradually uh, wear me down. It's a four. It's a four for me. Four. Yeah, four at best. Um, okay. Uh, so I have one project that Cosmatus was attached to after Shadow Conspiracy. Actually, he, the article that I read said that he was attached to it during post production on Shadow Conspiracy, and it was uh, uh, it was a new version of Tarzan for uh, right. 20th Century Fox. Um, he said, I want to do it in the vein of Johnny Weissmuller with a huge canvas using animals, the forest and the jungle and create a fantasy world of adventure, which hasn't been done before. <laughs> um, he said, uh, I grew up with those films and always wanted to do stuff in the Raiders of the Lost Ark vein without taking it too seriously. Um, that didn't happen. Um, I don't think that film ever was produced. Um mm. And I couldn't find any information on any other projects that he was attached to uh, in the the last years of his life. He he died of lung cancer in uh, 2005 uh, at the age of 64. Mm. <clears throat> um, okay, so we said at the at the top of the show that we were going to rank his films at the end. Yeah. Uh, so I'll tell you what. I'll I'll give you. We'll start at the bottom, right? And I'll give you my ten to six. Okay. Your top 10 Cosmatos films, <laughs> right? My top 10 Cosmatos films, starting at number 10 with surprise, surprise. 1997's Shadow Conspiracy. Right. 4 out of 10. Oof. Right. Uh, now, I, I a couple of these are pretty close. Like That's definitely his weakest film. But yeah. the, uh, Okay, so my number 9, I'm going to go with Sin as number 9. Okay. Um, I, just, I just think it's fatally flawed it's the only it's the only film in his in his uh filmography that i would say has that like sense of like this just fundamentally doesn't work because mm. there's some there's, it's like they tore pages out of the script you know it's yeah. the, we need to understand the relationship between those characters in order for anything that happens in the film to have any to carry any kind of weight yeah. or have any sort of resonance and we just don't yeah and it just doesn't work as a result of that uh number eight is escape escape to athena um, which is a complete mess, a complete shambles <laughs> with, with uh, you know, some action that works and some comedy that works and some style that works and uh, some sort of, like, you know, genre elements that are that intermittently sort of click. But overall, yeah, it's a, it's a complete mess. Those are both 5 out of 10. Right. I wouldn't quite say that I dislike either of those films. Um, okay, so that's, that's uh, tonight. So number, my number 7 is... Uh, my number seven is the Cassandra Crossing. Yeah, that's six out of ten. Uh, I like the beginning. I like the end when it goes full tilt, ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, but the the midsection, it, it just the energy just drains out of the movie as quickly as it drains out of the infected passengers. Mm. Um, and my number six, ooh. My number six, I'll say, is Rambo First Blood Part Two. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so give me your your ten to six. Okay, so no prizes for guessing my number ten. Then it is Escape to Athena, which is uh, the only one I've ranked. Uh, sorry, rated less than six out of ten, uh, which is a five, probably a four to be honest. If I if I was forced to think about it again. Um, Nine would be sin. Uh, I, you know, I agree with everything you've said. It, to be honest, it hadn't really dawned on me during when I was watching it, or at least wasn't like something that was like distracting me from appreciating the film for other reasons. But um, it is still, it feels very much like a film that, for whatever reason, is undercooked. Um, and that is a six out of ten for me, and it's his ninth. Best film. <laughs> uh, 
like we we always we said on in relation to a lot of his films that he's he's really good with details. Yes. Uh, Sin Sin for me is the only one that I'm focusing only on the details because there's nothing else. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. It's true. Sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. Um, number eight, Shadow Conspiracy. So that means our seven, sorry, eight, nine, ten are interchangeable. We we agree on the bottom three. Yeah. But just a different order. But Shadow Conspiracy is his mm. best. Is his sorry. It's his worst Fulham that's rated seven out of ten. I like it. Um. My number seven, and I think also your number seven, which means the bottom four is the same but different uh, orders. The Cassandra Crossing, uh, which you know, uh, actually no, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch these round. Sorry, Shadow Conspiracy is higher than Cassandra Crossing, so Cassandra Crossing is my number eight, and Shadow Conspiracy is my number seven. If I may, if I okay. may make that last minute change, um, and then where does that leave me? So I've got to give you my number six, which is of unknown origin, which is I think the first point at which we differ in terms of because you haven't given me that one yet, right? Of unknown origin, that's my number six, and no. it's in your top five. Okay, that's your, your number six, six okay. was Rambo, First Blood Part Two, right? First yeah, Blood okay, Part yeah. Two yeah. of unknown origin for me. Okay, so. So I'll give you my five to three. Okay. Uh, my number five is uh, Leviathan. Right. Um, yeah. My number four... Ooh, it gets close around this point. So my number four is Tombstone. Okay, right. No, no, sorry, sorry. No. no, no, you've said it now. You you can't retract these things. Oh. No, 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 go on, because I, I retracted one earlier, so I'll let you. Oh, yeah, sorry, okay. <laughs> completely confused there. Uh, so my number f- so my number four is going to be Tombstone, yeah, yeah. So it is Tombstone. That it came down, yeah, it came down from. See, sorry, I got confused there for a second. Right. Okay. Because, yeah, on on my rewatch, it it would have been before I rewatched it, I probably would have been higher. But okay, right. uh, my number four is Tombstone. My number three is Massacre in Rome. Okay. Which is probably the film on the list. Probably the film on the list that surprised me the most. Right. Uh, would I put that? Yes. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it has to be. Hmm. My number... Yeah, number th- that's to be number three, because that's an eight. My number five is Leviathan, so same as you. Uh-huh. Same um, you. My number four is Rambo First Blood Part Two, I think, which ultimately benefited from my previous familiarity with it, um, which, you know... Um, and and what, that was I think that was the first time I've watched it, is like a certified adult cinephile as well, not just like a teen consuming action films. Uh, and it clarified a few things and it, you know, made me appreciate it for reasons that when I was younger, I wasn't able to. Um, my number three then would be Massacre in Rome. Okay. Uh, my number two then is of unknown origin. Yeah, and my number one is Cobra. So that's the biggest disparity between our places. I think your number two is my number six, mm. and so my number two is Tombstone, and my number one is Cobra. So we agree on number one. So our one, our one to ten are all the same, just in different orders. But that's like, the first time that's ever happened. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? But uh, it, you know, inevitably with a filmography like this, apples and pears and all that, you're often. I mean, you know, you've suggested. I mean, you know, we were we were kind of flicking films around there as we were creating the top mm. ten or listening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're all very interchangeable, and it's it's a bit like you know, I don't want to be known as the guy who rates Rambo: First Blood Part Two above. You know, of unknown origin, I, <laughs> even though, even though I do, <laughs> but like you know, they're they're all very sort of interchangeable uh, around a certain point. Anyway, not all of them, but uh, you know, 
the the top six, let's say, or top seven, even, are all good. Sorry, what least. did you give? Did you give Cassandra Crossing a seven? No, I give it a six. But you put it above Shadow Conspiracy. No, I didn't because I flicked them around. Oh, did you? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Is that allowed? That's allowed. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah. okay, will we wrap it up? Um, yeah, sure. Okay, so thanks for listening to episode 15 of The Habitus, installment number three in our ongoing uh, journeyman series. Um, my name is Bobby Lowe, and I've been here with... Michael Patterson. Uh, please follow us on Twitter at Habitus Pod. Subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, uh, SoundCloud, YouTube. Um, leave reviews, likes, comments, share, retweet, and so on. Share, and, uh, comments, feedback, all welcome. And uh, we will talk to you next time. Thank you. Cheers.